I'd like to call to order the Avalon City Council meeting of Tuesday, September 1st. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? And begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if we could please have a moment of silence for Ron Doolin, who passed away within the last two weeks. He was a member of the Tuna Club for approximately almost 50 years. He was a homeowner and uh, spent many, many, many years on the island. And I would just like to take a moment to pray for our parents, our children, and our teachers as they work through these difficult times. Today, as you know, it's the first day of school, and um, I'm sh it met with a couple of glitches. I know that they are working frantically to, to get everybody online and get the kids working. So parents, um, we're thinking of you, and um, good luck to all. Also, as you know, the city is making some very serious decisions in the last week and, and couple weeks to come. It's a very sad time for all of us. We love our City of Avalon family and um, we just ev wish everybody the best as we move forward. I know there were some people who will not be employed with the city um, and our hearts go out to you. Um, also we know that the staff that will be left, uh, uh, left in the city will have, will have to work extra hard and I know that um, the reduction of staff will impact city services. We will try to do that, do this as gracefully as possible. Amen. And if we could please have the roll call. Councilmember Lavelle? Here. Councilmember Ponce? Here. Councilmember De La Rosa? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Cassidy? Here. And Mayor Marshall? Here. Are there any announcements or written communications? Uh, announcements, I just want to remind the public that today was the last day before you get charged uh, a late fee and tickets for um, golf carts and vehicle registration. The hours are 8.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. and that's Monday through Thursday. We have received a uh, written communication, one item on, uh, excuse me, one email on item number six and four on number seven. Thank you which was provided to all the council. Yes, thank you. Uh, department head reports? Anybody? Yeah, Captain Hawking is coming. Good evening, Captain John Hawking. Uh, I'd just like to talk about uh, two noteworthy incidents that happened uh, since the last council meeting. At the last council meeting, we spoke about the possibility of having uh, volunteers out uh, reminding people to put on their face masks. There was an incident on the Catalina Express where a small group of people wouldn't put on their face masks. The boat started to leave. The captain of the boat felt it was unsafe to keep them on the boat. He turned around and before the boat could dock back up to float five, one of the people jumped off the boat and started assaulting one of the people on the boat, the staff, that was telling them not to wear a face mask. And it's completely unacceptable. Deputies were already waiting for the boat. We didn't know he was gonna jump off before the boat was even tied up. They immediately arrested him and took him to uh, Avalon Sheriff Station where uh, he was released on a citation because of the no bail, <laughs> zero mm -hmm. bail. But he will have a court date and it's completely unacceptable. Another incident that was unacceptable was a hate crime that we had on the island at the Descanso Beach Club. There was two men that were gay. They gave each other a small uh, peck on the lips and there was somebody that took offense to that and started yelling uh, homophobic uh, slurs at them and threatening them. And the deputies, uh, we got a call 911. We arrived 
and immediately took the person into custody. And I can tell you there was a lot of people over there that were protecting these two men. Mm -hmm. And it was good to see because that is just completely unacceptable. And uh, we're going to make an arrest every single time for anything like that. Mm -hmm. So that person would, is also going to have a court date in the very near future. Oh boy, and tough one. We continue you, to write for citations yeah. for masks also. I just turned in a handful to Denise just now, and we keep writing them and mm -hmm. go from there. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions for me? Did you want to? I, I did want to comment. Um, reading the report in the paper over the weekend, uh, these people who are doing dumb things and getting caught, and you're coming out to see them. The fact that you're also giving them a citation for not wearing a mask while they're being stupid is great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'll pass that on to the deputies. And you guys know what I feel about masks. Everybody needs to wear one. No doubt about it. We don't, I personally don't know if they work, don't work, but the rules say you wear one. Doctors wear them. I'm going to wear one. And we're going to do everything we can to get people to wear them. But if you aren't wearing one and you're also doing some shenanigans, that's we're definitely going to be there to, mm -hmm. to solve that problem mm -hmm. and go from there. But thank you very much. I will pass that on to the deputies. I would just like to make a comment. I know there was one incident on social media where a whole bar was set up with alcohol and whatever on the tops and the bottoms, you know, and on the sand. And there was another big party. I don't know how, I know we've been rather lenient on the alcohol because um, it doesn't seem to be getting too out of hand however when something is that blatant and obvious i don't know how those aren't seen by the sheriffs if they're doing patrols up and down the beaches and at step beach particularly so um i'm trying to warn people not to do that it's that's that's just mm -hmm. so blatant it's insane but um Anyway, are you talking them. businesses have set up bars? No, no, and people, are, people that are bringing a six foot we, table and and go ahead. Yeah, because I was that was the other thing I was going to bring up is that I've had people come to me and say they're bringing their cocktails into stores and in, and walking up and down Front Street just because you can buy it in a restaurant to go with your food and take it with you doesn't mean that gives you the right to walk up and down with cocktails in your hand on Front Street, on Clarissa, on 3rd, wherever, because I watch them as they walk by with their red okay. party cap. Um, so that was one of the other things I was going to ask, if you guys could kind of keep an eye out for Yeah, that. we sure will. That uh, We've known that's been a problem, especially for some of the restaurants that are serving because of the ABC license that now says they can buy it get in their vehicle, drive to their rental place or wherever. And the problem is, as they're walking there, they're drinking from the drink. Yeah. The city has contacted a couple of the businesses. We wrote a letter to one of them, and I've talked to ABC uh, regarding one of them, mm -hmm. uh, alcoholic beverage and control. And we will be enforcing the alcohol on the beach. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I mean, I hear, yeah, I hear it's blatant when they've got a bottle of Jack and they're going like this and passing the jack around to their friends, that's a little over the top. Yeah, that's So they're, get, they're going to the liquor store and buying those or going to lawns, you know. So it's those little blatant ones. And so thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. We, we will address that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a quick question, Captain Hawking, as well, for this weekend. Is, are we having any reserve deputies? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay, thank you. We're going to have uh, four reserve deputies. Two are going to be on uh, day shift to PMs, and two are PMs to early morning shift. Thank so you. So we'll have uh, four extra person uh, deputy personnel out there. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Appreciate Thank it. you. Double duty here. Um, so just a couple of things we've got coming up here in the next uh, few weeks uh, that we're working on with the community. The first one, uh, in collaboration with the Rotary, is a cleanup day. We've got two cleanup days slated. Going to be different from the cleanup days we've done in the past, where it's been a big get together. Um, we'll greet everybody. We have refreshments. Um, the first one will be Thursday, September 10th at 5 o'clock, across the street. Uh, you've probably seen the community, and we're due for a cleanup. Uh, we've scheduled a second one on Saturday, November 14th at 9 a.m. Again, across the street. 
as individuals come up, families come up, as soon as they get there, we'll give them the bag, we'll give them um, you know, gloves, the necessary tools that they need, and we just send them out on different routes throughout the community uh, with a drop-off point. So again, the 10th um, of September at 5 o'clock and then November 14th, um, which is a Saturday morning at 9 a.m. At 9 a.m. Okay. So please join us for that. And then uh, there's been a group, um, and it's mainly them, Mary Boyd and Grant Anther, Anther um, they've been working um, with the American Red Cross on a blood drive. Um, we have scheduled a blood drive um, at the St. Catherine Alexandria Church um, for Thursday, October 1st, and then Friday, October 2nd. It's a two-day drive this year uh, using the parish hall. Last year, I am told, um, we had 93 pints uh, that we received, um, donated blood, that helped 279 people benefited from that. So it's amazing to see how far that goes. Mm -hmm. uh, the goal this year on the two day is 150 pints of blood. And the beauty of it is that um, this year there will be antibody testing as part of um, you know, giving blood. They'll go through the process and you'll get your results on, on that as well. Um, I'd like to, if I could, a couple sponsors to, um, to recognize. But before that, uh, register online. It's at www.redcrossblood.org. And you just go to, um, I think you put in your zip code 90704, and it'll take you through 9 to 330. They're taking appointments on both days. And um, give me that, that email address. It's redcrossblood.org. Okay. Thank you. Um, they've got a handful, more than a handful of people coming back and forth. Um, this group of Grant and Mary um, have gone out and contacted a bunch of the hoteliers. So instead of sending staff back and forth for two days, uh, all of them are going to be staying. And so a special thanks go out to, let me do the hotels here first, the Catalina Island Company, uh, Pavilion, Holiday Inn, Hotel Metropole, Catalina Island Inn, Glenmore Plaza, and Seaport Village Inn, Avalon Hotel, and the Hotel Atwater. Wow. Um, three nonprofits have stepped up in a big way, um, and those are the Lions Club with a donation of $1,000, uh, Rotary Club uh, is stepping up with a donation and the Knights of Columbus with a donation. And so the goal there would be to, whatever other costs are associated with this, um, donations will come through the city and it will pay for the direct cost to um, the express rides over and a, and a few other expenses that we've got with that. Um, a couple other special uh, thanks, City of Avalon for assisting with it, uh, St. Catherine's uh, Church, and then ABM parking services along with Avalon Freight Services and the Catalina Express. Wow. So, yeah, so kind of a neat, uh, neat program coming up. So with that, any questions? Just to make sure the times were 9 to 3.30? 9 to 3.30 appointments, yes. Great, Great. thank you. Thank you. That, that, that takes a lot of coordination. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Harbor's, Harbor's quiet today? Okay, JJ, thank you. Um, is sitting at, oh, I'm sorry, Tony. Hi, everyone. Oh, uh, yes. Jordan Monroe, Administrative Analyst for the City of Avalon Department of Public Works. Uh, we finished up our Five Corners uh, demonstration last week. We're going to keep the survey open until Thursday at noon, so anybody who has any comments, questions, concerns, visit cityofavalon.com forward slash five corners. You can also find it from the homepage. Uh, we're taking everyone's feedback and input, uh, going to compile some responses and answers, and then uh, we'll also be using that as part of our grant application, which is due September 15th, that uh, we expect to fully fund uh, the total project. We came within three points the last round, so we're very hopeful that we'll be able to get it this round. Um, and speaking on another grant, if everybody remembers the uh, recycle bins we received, from Cal Recycle. Part of that grant was education outreach and public input, um, mostly just kind of educating the public on the importance of recycling, uh, diversion, and the use of recycle bins. So fortunately we have, I have to get out of this presentation. Okay. So we got, uh, we'll have some promotional materials coming out that people will be able to see. Uh, uh, flyers and other information just to kind of help people understand uh, and we produced this video 
with uh, Justice Ramey. Uh, he came out and did it. We'll have it on our website at cityofbabylon.com forward slash RRR. Uh, we have a longer version, but we decided to show you the 38 second version instead of the three minute version here. So give me one second, let me change the view. Catalina Island is a beautiful place. Whether you visit for a day, stay overnight, or live here for generations, everyone is a part of our island community. What we don't want to be a permanent part of our island are your recycled products. Please don't fill our landfill with bottles and cans. Using one of the over 100 recycling bins we have along the waterfront and in our parks, keep your trash separated from the recyclables. We will send your recyclables off the island to be processed, and maybe even come back so you can enjoy the view or even to use as a bin to recycle your bottles and cans. Thank you for doing your part by recycling. Catalina Island is a beautiful place. Whether you visit for a day So good morning, uh, good morning, <laughs> good evening, Mayor, members of council. I have a uh, brief uh, COVID-19 update. Uh, hopefully this will dovetail uh, real nicely into uh, Dr. Davis's um, presentation as well. Did you want him to go first? Oh, you know what, I'll, I will come back. I'll let uh, Dr. Davis go and then I'll give a, a brief update to the county. Sorry, I jumped the gun Those on that. Those aren't our miscommunications, okay. okay. I thought yours would play real nicely right after. Thank you. Great. Sorry, Michael. Are you ready to go to the presentation then? Oh, yes, oh, I yeah. am. We didn't go uh, to your reports or anything. Do you want to wait till after? Let's go presentation. Do we want to do, I don't know, since Dr. Davis is just sitting around, we want to do him now? Yes. Please. Okay, thank you. Do we have an introduction for him? Sorry. Dr. Davis will provide an update on COVID-19 situation. Yeah, I'm just, okay. just expecting somebody to introduce him. So okay. Dr. Davis, are you there? Uh, yeah, I, can, I can just hear you. Okay. But I hear myself echoing. Uh, Jordan, can you fix that? For the public, we have Dr. Daniel Davis at the Catling Island Medical Center. He will be giving us a, a third presentation on the uh, coronavirus. Go ahead, Dr. Davis. We'll see if the echoing stops. Is that my cue? Yes. Yes, please. Okay, are you just hearing an echo or? You're good here. Uh, just proceed. We do not hear an echo. Oh. What was that? Boy, that was a delay on that one, wasn't there? I think you'll have something off the top right into uh, Jordan's computer for me to be able to hear. Thank you. 
Okay, if you wait just a minute, we're waiting for Jordan to give us the signal. So Dr. Davis, I have a question. When we're looking at this picture of the coronavirus, do they color them that way so that we can see them better? Or are they, are they just, are they really red and blue? Mm -hmm. I, can, I can hear that you're asking about the coronavirus picture, but like, you're coming in garbled, so I can't quite understand. I was wondering, no, I was just wondering if it was color enhanced to be red and blue. Yeah, someone will have to translate right into Jordan's microphone, because I could hear when he was, when someone was close to the computer, I could hear Jordan pretty well, but everyone else sounds like uh, they're underwater. No problem. Huh? What do you think? Do you think it's colored in here? Dr. Davis, we're waiting for Jordan to figure out the technical difficulties. Okay. I can hear that person. Mm -hmm. All right, so he's telling me to call the number. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I can hear you as well. Um, and can you see me? Can you see the slides on the screen? You must have, because I heard somebody say something about a blue coronavirus. <laughs> I was just wondering if the red and blue of the virus is color enhanced. This one is probably color enhanced, but you can. You can uh, pick antibodies that are fluorescent in different colors that attach to different proteins or different parts of the virus. So you could have a red, an a red antibody attaching to the spike protein and something more green attaching to the body. But I think this one's probably color enhanced. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, proceed please. All right, so you can see my slides and you can hear me now. And I can hear you guys. So uh, thanks for having me back. It seems like it's been years since I last uh, spoke to the group because the uh, time seems to be on a strange time warp right now. But um, I'm going to try and give you a little bit of update and perspective and maybe even a prediction or at least some possibilities as to what I think might happen over the next couple of months. And then I'll uh, hopefully have uh, plenty of time for folks to ask questions. Um, okay, so let's see if I can uh, advance. There we go. All right, so I'm going to briefly go over the numbers, um, but I'm going to pose some questions that I'm not sure anyone has answers for, but at least should uh, make you a little bit wary, uh, depending on who you're listening to. And then reflect that back to the Catalina situation, and then again, try and give you some perspective and some predictions on what we think might happen over the next few months uh, going into 2021. All right, so here are the latest numbers. These are graphs that I've shown you before with the daily new cases on the top and the daily deaths on the bottom. So this is not cumulative. Um, these are you know, how many new cases and deaths are reported each day with each one of those lines representing a day. And so you probably can sense that for most of the summer there's been some angst um, reflected in the press and, and from, uh, especially in, in uh, California here, over what we were calling a surge. Uh, and you can see uh, on the right-hand side of the graph that there were uh, quite a number of new cases and quite a number of new deaths. For those who have been following along with my previous presentations, this is not a log graph, this is linear, so um, the difference between the lines is consistent. Um, 
and that's important in trying to interpret these. But there's no question that if you look in the right-hand side of the graph, uh, which represents the summertime, versus the left-hand side, which represents the springtime, it seems like things were quite a bit worse, um, particularly with regard to new cases throughout the summer. And we're gonna kind of dive deeper into that in a second. Now, one thing that I like to point out that gives me at least a little bit of confidence in these graphs is that there is a little bit of a lag about a couple of weeks between a spike in cases and a spike in deaths, and that's what you would expect because it takes several weeks for someone who contracts and then becomes symptomatic from COVID to actually get sick enough to potentially die. And so you see the little humps on the top followed a couple of weeks later by humps on the bottom. And if you follow this out, you can sort of track along. And so there's definitely a relationship between spikes in new cases and then two weeks later, spikes in death. That means we have to take these graphs seriously um, but again, I'm going to ask a few questions that I'm not sure anyone has the answer for. Now, we received a request to produce some data from Catalina, um, and there were some concerns given that we have such a small number of cases that you could identify individuals. But I clumped them into two-week blocks just for this presentation, and you can see that Catalina's daily, or in this case, bi-weekly new cases um, follow along with what was happening in, in California as a whole for the most part where there was a spike in, in uh, late July, early August and now it seems to be tapering off a little bit. So we are essentially a microcosm of the, uh, the larger you know, population in the state. Knock on wood, we have not had deaths so we definitely don't track along with that and let's hope that it stays that way. And I'll briefly summarize the, the response from the medical center. And um, while you, that's definitely my, my clinical home, I also am gonna take some liberties in talking about the medical center as if I'm an outsider, um, because that gives me some latitude to be able to give them uh, compliments, because I think it's been a very impressive performance from all levels uh, at the medical center for something that nobody had any um, historical perspective on and that we have essentially been able to perform what everyone wished they could do which is contact tracing um, and try and track down as many individuals as possible who came into contact with known COVID positive individuals and help them um, isolate as best they can and although um, I know that there are uh, criticisms and concerns about whether individuals were, were following uh, the guidelines the way they're supposed to. We have not seen substantial community spread, again, not on wood, in Avalon or on the island, um, that most of the cases have come from outside the community and even those that spread within the community did not lead to outbreaks like we've seen over town or even uh, in other countries where one individual passes it on to 50 or 60 or 100 or more individuals. And so for the most part, the outbreaks, while they've certainly produced a lot of anxiety, um, have not led to widespread dissemination of COVID. And like I said, a lot of the cases that uh, tested positive on the island were contracted uh, off the island. When we know about cases, they've been monitored and treated appropriately and that involves coordination between the emergency department depending on, on where the case was identified in the clinic or if a patient has been, become sick enough to be transferred off the island then backwards with the clinic coordinating with the emergency department uh, to safely transfer. And that when that has occurred, the patients have been sick enough to warrant admission but not so sick that they couldn't be treated effectively and, and recover. And so I think uh, from all counts, um, the contact tracing and then the monitoring and triaging of patients has gone exceedingly well. And again, although I've been part of that, I would point the finger at, at Jason and at Dr. Sakaria from UC Irvine as being the primary coordinators of that response, um, which I think has been fantastic. And because we have a facility that has both a hospital and a long-term care facility as well as a clinic and an emergency department all under the same roof. 
we've prioritized keeping the long-term care residents safe and again knock on wood a lot of knocking on wood tonight um they've thus far remained safe and uh, we've been able to keep uh, everyone sequestered and so um again i'm very uh, pleased and, and impressed as an outsider looking in with the response and as someone on the inside it's been an incredibly rewarding experience to work with this team which if there's a bright spot in the, the pandemic it's that uh, we really have come together as a team now let's dive a little bit deeper into the data so i called it summer summary just to play on words a little bit here and i want to try and reflect and maybe scratch my head a little bit on the disconnect between the official statistics and our clinical experience. Um, so if we go back to our graph of daily new cases, um, and you look at the summertime, again, rep represented there on the right, versus the springtime represented on the far left, where you see March and April, and you compare that to my favorite graph, which as an EMS medical director for Riverside County and for um, several of the air ambulance, the helicopter bases in Southern California, I get access to a whole different set of data. Um, and we're gonna compare the two because they're quite a bit different. So here you see that I call wave one, which is the initial appearance of coronavirus in uh, California. And then there was a bit of a lull, although it's not really reflected well in the graph. And then this impression that there's been a second wave that's even worse you know, perhaps even five to 10 times worse than wave one uh, through most of the summer and just now starting to, to uh, wane a bit. Now compare that to my favorite graph of all, which is the influenza-like illnesses in the emergency departments and EMS calls, 911 calls. What you're seeing here is the previous year, 2018-19 season with dashed lines compared to the current season, 2019-20, in solid lines, with red representing emergency department visits and blue representing EMS calls. And you see the prominent solid red peak in December, January, and early February that represents influenza itself. That was before we really saw significant coronavirus, and I know a lot of Patients have come to the clinic and hospital thinking they may have had something that sounds a lot like coronavirus uh, back in December or even back in November, um, but certainly in December, January, and February. None of those folks have tested positive or indicated that they had antibodies. So it looks like most of what we saw back in December, January, February was really influenza. That started to drop away toward the end of February, beginning of March, and then you see right in the middle of the screen, in solid red, the initial spike of coronavirus, where we had 1,200 emergency department visits a day, and this represents Riverside County, um, because that's where I'm a medical director, but the same data could be presented for any of the Southern California counties. And a similar hump in EMS runs down there in the solid blue at the bottom, then a lull, and then you see in June, July, and August a hump, but a much smaller hump, about a fifth the size of what we saw in March and April. And that's really interesting because the summertime new cases of coronavirus were about five times higher than in the spring, and yet the EMS visits, or EMS runs and commence from visits were about five times lower than what we saw in the spring. And so there's your flu, here's your wave one, and here's your wave two. But let's lay them on top of each other. You can see I kind of went to town with the graphs here. So now we're seeing that all the months match up here. Um, and you see with that first spike in ED visits that correlated with a small spike in new cases. And then you can track the two little humps there um, in ED visits and new cases there. So they definitely match up as far as the pattern goes. Um, and even if we look at death, so now I just switched over to looking at death, we see the same sort of overall pattern, but we still see a reversal um, from the summer to, from the spring to the summer. 
And so a lot of us are scratching our heads when the numbers would indicate that things are twice as bad, five times as bad now through the summer. And yet our experience in the emergency department and the hospitals in the um, EMS has not matched what we see with the numbers. So how do we explain this? Well, I don't want to go too deep down this rabbit hole, but clearly there is a politicization of this pandemic. And while I suspected that was already the case, I have a dear colleague who's part of the government and the public health department in Southern California who will remain nameless, but he said that the quote that everyone is citing to each other is, don't let a good pandemic go to waste, which is fairly black humor there um, because uh, I don't know that anybody thinks the pandemic is necessarily good, but it doesn't take long. In fact, as I prepared for this lecture, the easiest slide to create was simply putting in Democrat, Republican, coronavirus, and thousands, if not tens of thousands of graphs popped up from both sides of the aisle trying to demonstrate why the other one is mishandling the pandemic. And it's really disappointing that not only is there rhetoric um, suggesting, and you could maybe call it constructive criticism, although I'm not sure constructive is the right word, um, but it seems to have spilled even into the way that we collect and report data. Um, and so that brings up the sort of second piece of that puzzle. Is the data that we're getting actually accurate or are there incentives to over or under report? And I think we've seen that um, played out in the news. And so that's why I felt that I had to find multiple sources of data to get a clear picture of what's going on. And I try and present all different types of data, but I still am scratching my head a little bit as to how the spring versus the summer is so dramatically different depending on which source of data you access. And we're gonna dive deeper into that in a second. Now one thing we have seen that's quite interesting to me um, is a change in the source of the cases. And specifically what I mean by that is that it appears that the United States, which is the left hand, unfortunately this came out in the same color, but the, uh, the initial spike that you see on the left represents the United States and a very early surge in COVID cases, followed by Mexico, which didn't have quite the surge and it was delayed somewhat, which is why Mexico on the very far right there is still trailing behind the United States. I think uh, most people suspect we probably exported it to Mexico, um, but once Mexico got up and running, they quickly caught up, and we saw that in our data, again, with access to data that aren't necessarily uh, on the, the typical websites. But what you're seeing here is the case rate per 10,000 citizens um, at a point uh, in the last month or so where you see clearly along the border there is a surge in cases and, a, and in fact if you look at metro areas across the country El Centro is number two in the country behind only Huntsville, Texas which is smack in the middle of Texas so I'm not sure what happened there and if you look at counties in California Imperial County is by far um, the, the highest number of cases per thousand citizens. And I think that reflects, not surprisingly, um, cases coming across from Mexico, either U.S. citizens uh, or, or not. Um, but either way, cases coming across. And in fact, for me as the medical director for the helicopters in that area, it's not an uncommon occurrence to get woken up in the middle of the night with a COVID patient being transferred from El Centro and poor El Centro Hospital was so inundated, they were putting out a plea to any hospitals in California, including Central and Northern California, that would take their patients. And I like this quote, that at baseline, they might transfer a patient every other day out of their hospital, and that once the pandemic got going, they were trans transferring a patient every two or three hours. Um, and so uh, I think Part of what we've seen through the summer is the delay in cases that were coming from Mexico um, because they hit the pandemic hit them a little bit later than it did us. And I think now they're starting to get on top of that and El Centro is starting to clear out. 
But the other interesting thing is the change in the mortality. Although you did see a spike in death and new cases in the summertime, um, there was a distinct decrease in mortality. And so I'm going to go back to these same graphs. And this is something you can do at home if you want to play along, um, because these are available to everyone. But if we look at these same graphs I've been looking at, and we look at the fact that the spike in deaths is about two weeks behind the spike in cases, then we can look at the peak in cases in the spring, which was about 2,000 a day, and the peak in deaths in the spring, which was about 100 a day, and roughly calculate a mortality rate. Now, that's not the perfect way to do it. Epidemiologists would roll over in their graves. Now, but it's a quick and dirty way to get a sense of what mortality looks like. And you can see that mortality early on was about 5%, which was actually the average across the world. And then when you get over to the summertime, where the peak was about 10,000 patients a day, and the peak in death hit about 200 a day, just to make the numbers easy, which equates to about a 2% death rate. Mm -hmm. So is this real? Are we really seeing that the virus or the, the chance of dying from the virus is going down? Or how do we explain this? I would love to be able to say that we are doing a better job treating patients, but the few sort of new therapies that you've seen hit the, the press have not really had the impact that could explain such a dramatic drop. Sure, remdesivir was approved um, yeah, somewhere in between the spring and the summer, and it's being used uh, for most patients who are hospitalized and certainly those in the ICU um, with COVID. But it was actually being used long before that for most patients in Southern California as part of clinical trials. So I don't think that quite explains it. Um, dexamethasone or decadron uh, was published as a potential therapy by the Brits. And again, that had some impact on patients who were on ventilators, which was the, one that, the, the ones that died. But again, the impact can explain such a dramatic difference. I think most people believe it probably has to do with the fact that the patients testing positive now are oftentimes minimally or completely asymptomatic, and that when you start getting a large number of asymptomatic cases, then your denominator goes up, and the few deaths uh, that occur uh, are relatively smaller compared to the larger number of patients uh, that are testing positive, and that involves the contact tracing we talked about earlier. But a very tempting thing to talk about, and I'll ask the comment on this, is the fact that the virus is mutating. It's supposed to mutate. That's kind of what it does. That's how it became able to infect us in the first place, is that it mutated. And if we learn anything from SARS back 10, 15 years ago, um, then we should expect that this virus is going to mutate over a period of months. And we've already been able to show that that is the case through various genetic laboratories. Here is an article that I pulled just from the last the couple of days, yesterday in fact, um, about uh, the Malaysians demonstrating that the strain that they have is different now than it was even just a few weeks and months ago. And that particular strain, when the press gets a hold of it, loves to sensationalize it. Of course, they uh, publish it with this picture of some sort of a, uh, action figure protecting a woman and her child from deadly coronavirus coming in from the right uh, because this mutation has made it more infectious. And very deep in the article is also commentary that it's much less virulent. It doesn't tend to kill people nearly as often, but it's easier to pass around. And those two things are probably related. If you have a less virulent strain, then people are walking around who aren't really that sick or may not even realize that they're infected. And so they're able to contact 10, 20, 50, 100 people uh, over the course of their illness and pass it along. The virus really doesn't want to be that virulent. It doesn't want to kill us. It just wants us to have snot coming out of our nose so that we can pass it along to each other. But it doesn't really want us to feel bad enough to lay in bed all day where we can't contact as many people. So the perfect virus is one that produces minimal symptoms and is easily spread. It needs a few 
boogers and snot to make us sneeze and cough every now and then to make sure that it can be spread, but otherwise it really doesn't want to hurt us. And that's exactly what happened with SARS. <laughs> so it's possible that this will be the fate of this coronavirus. Uh, we can't necessarily plan based on an expectation that it will mutate, but it certainly is following a uh, pathway that would suggest that it's going to continue to do so. So what should we expect heading into the fall? Will the flu season, the traditional sort of November, December through February, March, include a spike in cases? Well, we thought that there would be a break from COVID in the summer because we tend to think of coronaviruses as being primarily wintertime cold type viruses. And we certainly didn't see much of a temperature effect in the summer. So does that mean then there won't be a invert temperature effect in the winter. Well, the main thing that produces flu season for us is not the temperature outside directly, but the fact that um, when it drops below 60 degrees in California, we tend to go indoors, the kids go back to school, etc. Um, and so clustering indoors will likely produce a spike in influenza, as well as anticipated a spike in, in coronavirus particularly if we're not doing the things that we're supposed to uh, with regard to the masking and hand washing, et cetera, and maintaining some distance. And we probably will, as we have every year, seen a spike in influenza. Now, maybe it won't be as bad this year uh, because the same measures that prevent the spread of coronavirus will also prevent the spread of influenza. Um, but the same indoor uh, clustering that the uh, every year will probably um, lead to some transmission of coronavirus as well. So I would be surprised if we don't see some spikes as, uh, as we head back indoors. It is now documented that you can have coronavirus as well as other things. That includes bacterial infections like pneumonia, but it also includes other viruses, including influenza. Um, at the very beginning, when we didn't have a test for coronavirus, we would exclude coronavirus by testing people for influenza, and if they came up positive, we said these symptoms are probably influenza, not coronavirus, and we probably won't be able to say that going into this flu season, but fortunately we can test for both now. And here's the million dollar question, or billion dollar, and maybe trillion dollar question. What about a vaccine? Well, first let's talk about the influenza vaccine. This is probably a year, if you're on the fence, that you should just go ahead and get it. It's the last thing you need is influenza and coronavirus together. And although, you know, the, the, the effectiveness of the influenza vaccine varies from year to year, uh, I'm gonna be first in line you know, to get my flu shot. Uh, just to uh, take that one off the table as much as I can, or certainly if I contract uh, and, and uh, minimize the symptoms. So that brings up the possibilities for the horizon of coronavirus. We talked about mutations. I would love it if it mutates. A lot of uh, vaccine-making companies would cry, and you know, who knows, maybe we wouldn't even find out. I think there's going to be a lot of push for vaccination regardless. But what about that vaccine? Well, it looks like it will, there will be something approved in October, if only because the election is at the beginning of November. I think there's a lot of pressure to get something out there, whether you agree with that or not. Um, it's probably going to happen. And the drug companies are going in big with this one. Not only has the research gone at a blistering pace to where we have legitimately several dozen candidate vaccines, using various techniques, but all sort of focusing on that spike um, that we saw in red on the, on the, the uh, title slide. But the companies that own the patents for these have teamed up with the big names, the Merck's and the, the Pfizer's and the federal, um, and they are making literally millions, tens of millions of vaccines even before they've demonstrated themselves effective or not. They're going all in with the bet being that the early small trials and the demonstration that these vaccines do produce 
an antibody response that looks a lot like somebody who recovered from COVID, and even a T-cell response, which are the cells that ultimately make the antibodies, um, or produce the, the stimulus to make the antibodies, um, but that uh, the response looks close enough to somebody who recovered, in some cases even better, that they believe that these were right, and they're going to make so many vaccines that we should be able to vaccinate a whole lot of folks very early on. I suspect it will be a lot to healthcare workers and people who are high risk patients, not necessarily high risk of getting it, but high risk of complications if they were to get it. And so we'll probably see nursing home um, patients, we'll see patients who have comorbidities that would predict um, intubation or death. And those folks will probably have the opportunity to get vaccinated before the end of the year. And that would be an incredible feat for science to be able to pull that off, but everything seems on track. And I would be surprised if we don't start seeing widespread vaccination before the end of the year and limited deployment, maybe even before Halloween, certainly before um, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Now, this vaccine will not be perfect. I can guarantee you that up front. It looks pretty darn good in the animal studies. We don't have a lot of data from actual patients, but the antibody response makes it look pretty good. But we've never seen a perfect vaccine, and these types of viruses are tricky, and so I think we will be happy if we get anywhere above 50% effectiveness and if we get close to 75 or 80 percent, that will be a heroic victory for the vaccine. Now, it may still be good enough, and there's two ways that it can be good enough. It may, even if it doesn't stop someone from getting coronavirus, it may turn it into just a little bit of a cold or even a mild flu. And if we can get enough people vaccinated, it will actually have a hard time being transmitted from person to person. If you remember, six months ago, we were hoping that there were going to be enough asymptomatic carriers that recovered and that would produce herd immunity, that is enough people would have antibodies against it um, from already having contracted it, that it wouldn't be able to tra uh, transmit through the community. But it looks like at best we're sitting at around 10 or, 10 or so percent and that may, may even be a little bit optimistic and so I don't think we're anywhere close to the point where we're going to see herd immunity from actual contraction of coronavirus. And so the vaccine uh, will be necessary. The other big question mark is how long immunity will last. If you watch the, the papers and, and the news reports, um, you'll see that there are now a couple of patients who have had coronavirus twice. There's not a lot of detail on whether the second time through wasn't so bad compared to the first time through, but they documented that they had antibodies, they disappeared, and then they got sick again. And that unfortunately is one of the things we've come to expect with coronavirus antibodies. They don't seem to last as long as for other diseases like polio. And so we will likely have to get immunized uh, on at least an annual basis and the initial immunization involves a shot followed by another one a month later um, just to get that initial response up and running. So this may end up being an annual kind of thing, maybe even more often than that at the beginning until it disappears uh, from the earth or at least we don't see significant disease anymore. You've also heard us talk about various treatments um, remdesivir being the initial one approved and then some other therapies uh, like uh, dexamethasone or steroid um, that are used for the sickest patients. The problem is that they have to be, at least the remdesivir, has to be given intravenously. You've also heard things like using the blood from people who have recovered um, and that's probably part of why they're testing when we uh, have blood drives to see if there are people who have antibodies that maybe could use their plasma to treat people who are just getting the disease and, it, and maybe keep them from having to be intubated or even dying. Um, but again, that has to be given intravenously, and so we're really holding out for an oral agent. And there is one that I was talking about six months ago that's got 
gotten all the way to its final clinical trials and we'll see how it goes. Um, we're very hopeful because it appears to be well tolerated and at least in animals is highly effective at preventing progression of disease. Um, and then you're seeing a lot of uh, studies that are looking at existing drugs, a lot of them for either rheumatoid arthritis or malaria, which often are the same drugs, interestingly, um, but repurposing those uh, to see if they might work against coronavirus. And so there has been some small steps forward, um, but we really haven't seen uh, the major move forward that we're waiting for. And I think the fall will probably bring us to the end of the trial that will tell us whether uh, some of these drugs are going to be uh, available. And that could be a game changer as well. So the combination of a vaccine and the possibility of new drugs, including oral, oral agents, uh, may make the uh, fall and winter much more tolerable than we originally thought. All right, so here you see a soapbox, and those are my feet on it. So I'm going to give you my two cents, whether you want them or not. I've tried to sort of stay out of the political fray, um, but uh, I know people feel strongly on both sides, so when you try and stay down the middle, uh, what ends up happening is both sides think you're favoring the other side, but that's okay. I can handle it. Um, and my impression is that we are doing okay. Uh, if I had to give us a grade, maybe a B minus or a C plus, uh, we definitely weren't as prepared as we should have been. And that is not a Republican or a Democrat failure. It is not a federal or a local government failure. That is an American failure because we feel like these things aren't supposed to happen here. Um, and, uh, and that idea of exceptionalism leads to complacency. And there is no one in public health who doesn't recognize that to some degree we got caught with our pants down and that we didn't have everything in place. And in fact, we aren't even sure who is supposed to take the lead on stuff. We know who gets blamed, but the way that public health is supposed to work is that it acts on a local level for things like pandemics. So we should see a local, and that would be a county level um, in California, which is huge, in other states it could be a statewide level public health taking a lead role on decisions about uh, locking things down and opening things up. The federal government is supposed to focus on making sure there are ample supplies of things, making sure there's testing, which I think is one of the big failures uh, at the federal level, and then providing scientific expertise, coordinating, and making sure that each state or um, county has exactly what they need and, and playing kind of a uh, chess game of moving resources around. Um, but that isn't something we've had to deal with before. We were largely untouched by SARS, and the last time we really had a pandemic was over 100 years ago, and it's amazing to see how similar our response is now as it was 100 years ago because we were just as unprepared then as we are now. We've also seen a difference and there's some really interesting graphs that people are interested in this, um, that we don't really like being told what to do. And for some reason, masking has become a political statement, or I should say the lack of masking. is kind of like a don't tread on me uh, slogan. And it's really kind of odd because in other countries, and I get to travel all around a lot um, uh, and lecture, and so I was able to see at the beginning of the pandemic a little bit of this, they actually are glad to have advice from scientific experts saying, here's what we know, here's what we think you should do. They say thank you and they go and do it as opposed to you can't tell us what to do so we're going to flaunt the fact that you can't tell us what to do and wear the mask on our chin or hang it from our rear view mirror like I see over town here. Anything but what would actually be good for the health of the individual or certainly the people in their household. That being said, it always is interesting to see how quickly we adapt to the new normal and how quickly um, designer masks become a thing, masks with faces and mouths on them and all sorts of interesting stuff, or even masks with political statements on them. Um, and so uh, that's my first comment, is that we're doing all right. Um, anybody who's in public health would have said we are not ready, and I think this has proved out. I don't think we realized how different.
different Americans would react to advice, and I certainly didn't anticipate how political it would become, and maybe that should have been um, expected in an election year. Um, I am impressed with how quickly science has stepped up. Maybe that's because I see myself as a scientist, but given that it usually takes 10 plus years to create a vaccine and we're going to be able to do it in 10, 10 minus months, it is really going to be a story. And I think as we look backwards, it will be um, the big victory uh, of this pandemic is how quickly we were able to respond to it. And again, I'm gonna take the liberty on my soapbox to pat uh, the medical center on its back. Uh, because we really have served a role as a public health entity as well as a medical facility um, and the team has just come together, uh, particularly with the leadership. So the last little piece, when I went back to the very first presentation I gave at the beginning of March, I found exactly the same lessons with one exception at the bottom here I'll show you. You know, this is what I said back in March. This is a critical point because we don't know what's going to happen with the flu season and we don't know for sure that we'll have a vaccine or a therapy. So this is the point where I would say hang in there another couple of months and I'm hopeful that this will be um, on its heels and we'll be able to start moving out of this whole thing. But don't use this point to become complacent. We have a lot of vulnerable people and as I've started working in primary care here, I had no idea how many folks are uh, in the community with diabetes and hypertension and a history of heart disease and a history of lung disease and certainly I probably could have predicted some of the uh, obesity but uh, nevertheless there are a lot of folks here and they live with folks who are out there working two or three jobs that are in contact with folks who are testing positive and that's what I just don't want to see is somebody who doesn't realize that they had symptoms or were hanging out with someone who didn't realize they were having symptoms and they come back and bring it to their father or mother or grandmother, grandfather or grandmother. And so we really have to hang in there and there is an end in sight. So try and work with us. Again, you know, work with the hospital. We've tried to be flexible. We've really gone out of our way to try and make sure we can do the best testing available and we probably have better testing than most university hospitals over town right now. Um, check the website, you have patient, patient. Um, and the last thing, the only thing I added to the slide was to support the medical center and each other through this. Um, now it's natural that people when they're anxious um, start to look at you know, the behavior of others and if it's different, um, criticize them either because they think they're not taking it seriously enough or because they're taking it too seriously. Um, but realize that everyone's fighting their own battle here and that people are doing things for different reasons. Um, but uh, you can always take care of yourself. And I stay with my, my uh, contention that with my 1,500 paramedics and EMTs and my 1,500 flight crews across the country, by just simply wearing masks and washing their hands and doing the stuff they're supposed to do, we haven't, knocked on wood, again, had a single transmission from a patient to one of our workers. Mm. And so I, remember, I heard someone make the comment about they weren't sure whether masks do or don't work. And certainly not all masks are the same. That is definitely true. Um, but all of them do something. And as you get to things like three-ply of, of material, they come pretty darn close to the masks uh, that we're using on the front lines when our faces are right in the face of someone coughing and they're sticking tubes down their, their throat, etc. So I'm off my soapbox, and now I'm happy to answer questions. Hopefully I'll be able to hear them or you can read them or repeat them. Um, but again, thank you for inviting me back and for your attention. And uh, hang in there because I think we're good. Well, thank you, and you know you're welcome to come back any time. I uh, get nothing but accolades out, out, off of the good information that you send. And Michael, do we have anybody that's called in? I don't. I have a couple questions. Yes. Um, probably, uh, I don't know who better, Jason or Dr. Davis, but um, could you just reiterate for the public who's watching about um, what the numbers the testing numbers here on Catalina being only 
those have been tested here and not residents here that are tested on the mainland? Um, yeah, I mean, Jason is the one who enters the data in, and um, even the, the cases that I'm aware of have also received tests here, if only because at the beginning we were trying to um, prove that people were no longer infectious, and that was before we realized that um, people can turn their tests positive for months and months. So even folks that um, were essentially diagnosed off the island had positive tests here. Um, and so I don't know if, if, if somebody were treated by our providers here that had a positive test from elsewhere. Um, I'm not sure how many of those folks there are, and, and Jason would probably be the one to answer whether um, we would note those folks anywhere, but my impression is that we're only posting the patients in whom we have a confirmatory positive test, but with the knowledge that we may test some of those folks even if they had a, 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 an initial test elsewhere. I don't know if Jason is anywhere nearby yeah, that yeah. if you want to come in. Yeah. So the data that we supply, we only have knowledge of the, of the patients that receive tests from Catalina Island Medical Center. If you go over town, we do not under, we don't have any knowledge of that data or what's, what the results are or anything. So. Um, and I would also like to say that the turnaround time for testing has vastly improved. Uh, so there really is no reason to go over town to receive testing because we can provide it rapidly. And, you know, your ability to pay doesn't matter. All right. Good question. Go ahead. And then um, the other one was I, I've seen some threads on this. And honestly, it just gets so nasty on Facebook that I don't read all the comments anymore when it starts to go downhill. But there's a difference between um, reporting tests that have come back positive, and there's a lot of reasons in HIPAA reasons why you can't report active cases versus uh, recovered cases. Can you just re-explain? why we don't do that and right i think you've answered it online so i apologize if you have but as far as hipaa covers it doesn't matter as to whether we're releasing a patient name or not re releasing a patient name let's take for example uh if you had coronavirus and you said oh you went on facebook and said i have coronavirus and then uh two weeks down the road we tested you and we saw that you had antibodies and we were, you know, let's say we were going to post that you're now cured. Well, we're announcing to everybody that Cindy is cured. So we're providing medical information that somebody can put one plus one and figure out what your medical condition is. And that is not our role to inform the community about individuals. And so it sets us up for a liability. It sets, you know, firstly from fines and penalties from the federal and the state government, but it also sets us up with uh, legal liability with a possible lawsuit from you. And, and I guess just to further discuss that, the way that I've seen it, for example, um, Johns Hopkins and the LA County sites and some others, it's not necessarily saying um, recovered. It's it's listing these are the number of these are the number of positive cases, and unfortunately, there's another column of of those that we've lost due to the virus. So, I, I think it's the question keeps getting asked over and over. Why can't we Why can't we do that? But it, but that's not. The recovery number is not a separate column anywhere that I've seen on any other county statistics well, or whatnot. And then, you know, how, how can you necessarily tell if someone's fully recovered? I mean, if you've had the coronavirus and three weeks later, you're still shedding those cells. And if we tested you for coronavirus, you'd test positive. So, you know, there's, a, there's just a lot of leeway in this whole thing. 
Um, and there is a vast difference between the data that John Hopkins produces compared to us. Because we are rural, we have to be more careful about the data that we put out there um, due to the fact that we have small numbers. And it's easy to figure out what's going on. Oh, Cindy hasn't come out of her house in three days. You know, you've seen this within the community, that people trying to figure it out. I mean, and I, the reason why I want to keep the data the way it is is because of some of the, th plus some of the things I've seen on Facebook where the community is taking the data. So a number of weeks ago, we had a day where it went up by three. And at the exact same time, the city closed the summer camp. And then people were posting online that um, that three children were testing positive of COVID, which is completely inaccurate. And so then, if I hop on and say that is inaccurate, you can't. That information is incorrect. Well, then when somebody puts something then out there, and I don't say that's inaccurate, I'm virtually saying you're correct with your hypothesis. Now, I want to just stop the rumors and the finger pointing with who has had COVID and who has gotten, you know, who's cured from it. Um, it's none of our business. Just wear a mask. Stay outdoors. Don't go indoors without a mask and spend a lot of time with a whole bunch of people indoors. And you pretty much aren't going to get it. I agree. Yeah, and I, and I would... I would underscore that point but I would also kind of thank the community because we are not a public health we have no public health jurisdiction we are performing this these this contact tracing function only on the goodness of the hearts of people who have tested positive being willing to talk to people around them whether it's their boss their family their friends and have other people come in to get tested. And we, as a medical center, were able to absorb you know, literally hundreds of tests in a matter of a day or two. But that wasn't us going out and saying, hey, one of your employees tested positive, you need to send all your employees to us. It was completely the other way around because we're not allowed to do that. And so all we can say is when somebody tests positive, encourage them for the sake of the health of the community and to those around them and those they work with to let people know. And that, as I said at the beginning, we have been able to stop these little miniature outbreaks from becoming big deals um, and that for the most part, um, it's just a handful of folks uh, and the people that they're very close to that have tested positive and then it stops. And that's much more effective than what's happened on the mainland where public health is able to perform that function and go track people down. And we've been able to do it without, without that kind of jurisdiction. So I, I think that's not just um, tooting the horn of the medical center, it's really more a reflection of the community being as willing, despite what's posted on Facebook, despite the possibility that they're going to be ostracized or feel like you know there's a red letter on their their front door now um, for C for COVID. Um, despite all of that, we've been able to do contact tracing on the goodness of everyone's heart and really. Um, you know, perform the kind of public health that every other community in this country wishes they could perform. So, despite that it's disheartening to see the, the rhetoric online, I think we should step back and look at the 10,000 foot view and say, there's probably not another community that could pull this off. And, and so this has been a tremendous victory, even if there is some expected you know, infighting and finger pointing and, you know, people are, are nervous and anxious and they're going to, you know, look for someone to blame and they're going to be upset when they think things don't go the way they're supposed to. But for the most part, knock on wood, up until now, the first six months, this has gone amazingly well. 
And since I've isolated Cindy with all my examples, I just want to put out there, I have absolutely no knowledge as to whether she has COVID or not. <laughs> <laughs> So, Dr. David, I just wanted to make a comment. You were asking early on about, you know, how the numbers, uh, when they early on the death rate was like at 5%, and now the death rate is like 2%, right? Right. So, but at the beginning of this whole thing, weren't the institutional agencies, like all the nursing homes, those really got hit hard at first, and they were wiping out hundreds of, of seniors it seems like and maybe that has gotten better over time yeah that's a really good point that the the epidemiology of of cases has changed now is the, the the first i mean the first cases in the united states were up in washington in a nursing home so nursing homes in particular were seemed to be vulnerable in part because the people there have a lot of comorbidities and in part because they're packed in and they, they, they really can't get away. Um, so I think you're, that there's a part of that that's true. But those numbers, 5%, 2%, if you ask um, you know, the, the epidemiologists on the, on the front lines what the likelihood of someone, whether they're in the nursing home or whether they you know, work in a restaurant on Catalina Island, you know, all comers, the likelihood that they would die from coronavirus, the most current estimate is only about 0.1 or 0.2 percent. And that's because we probably haven't even scratched the surface on the number of people who have actually been exposed to the virus and had sort of an asymptomatic course or a minimally symptomatic course. And I think we've seen a number of folks on the island surprised that they tested positive uh, because they were tested only because they worked with someone or they were in the household of someone with coronavirus and so they went and got tested like they were supposed to and then they end up positive and it's kind of a really I can't believe it you know yeah maybe I had a little bit of a stuffy nose but I thought it was seasonal allergies not coronavirus and so you know I think there's a lot more of those than we realize and that the biggest reason we've seen the mortality drop is just because we're testing all of these folks who had minimal or no symptoms. But I think that you're absolutely correct that just by virtue of where the patients came from, the initial wave was in nursing homes with really sick people. And now, you know, if you follow the press, it's in bars and concerts where young people are partying and, and they're very low risk and so they're not likely to get it mm -hmm. um so uh yeah so i think that's another uh, another variable that uh that i didn't even talk about tonight but i really hope that the thing is mutating and that we're seeing a less virulent strain as well and that's what if you remember from my july i think it was presentation the head of infectious disease in italy came out strongly and said this is not the same virus we saw even two months ago and the world health organization quickly slapped him down and said don't say that it's going to make people complacent mm. but he said you know i want to give people hope and i want to be scientifically accurate that this is not the same virus and you may not want to hear that it may not be part of your messaging um but the mm. truth is the truth and i'm going to say it whether you like it or not mm. it led to a little bit of a kerfluffle in italy mm -hmm. Is there, did anybody call in, Mr. Palmer? I don't have any comments. Uh, council or staff? Dr. Yeah. Davis, can you just speak, uh, there's been a, an increase, it sounds like, in people who have recovered from having coronavirus, at least the first strain of it, in having some fairly significant after effects long after they've no longer tested positive. Can you speak to any of that? Um, absolutely, yeah. So, so one of one of the uh, side effects of me being involved in this is that I was asked to author an online educational module for physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, and so I'm wading deep in the literature on coronavirus. Um, and one of the new modules we released are the long-term sequelae. 
and immediately there was a pushback to say, how can you call it long term? We're only four to six months into this. So with that as the caveat, we don't really know long term. Um, but the way that I've tried to describe it is that what we're doing right now is we're trying to understand what coronavirus does in the context of other diseases that we know and, and we know well, like stroke, for example. So if coronavirus activates your clotting system and makes you more prone to having heart attacks and strokes, well, there's no reason to suspect that the long-term sequelae from a stroke due to coronavirus is any different from a stroke due to atherosclerotic disease and hypertension. So we know some of the long-term sequelae are going to be the same as the, 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 the diseases that just weren't caused by coronavirus, but ultimately end, end you up in the same place. And the majority of the sequelae fall into that category. Now, there are some weird neurologic ones that we're just trying to understand, but at the risk of consulting the neurologists, and I think there is actually one that lives on the island who's been very complimentary up until now, probably not anymore. But there's a lot of neurologic diseases that we don't understand very well that probably involve autoimmune phenomenon, so your body's antibodies attacking your own you know, components of your nervous system, that they often carry names like Guillain-Barre um, or even things like, like um, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, um, but that we don't fully understand um, the immune response. And it looks like coronavirus is going to do a whole lot of that kind of stuff where it can attack any part of your, um, your nervous system from the brain all the way down through the spinal cord and out to the, the nerves. And we're just now seeing um, these things start to manifest. And in fact, one of my closest colleagues, son, who's an intensivist, um, seems to be fighting some kind of a peripheral neuropathy that's partially paralyzed his diaphragm that we're all thinking is coronavirus, um, but they're having a hard time proving. And so there's a lot of these sort of mystery cases that um, are associated with coronavirus infection that look a little bit like diseases that we've seen before, but we really don't know what the long-term outcome is going to be. But for the most part, the side effects or the sequelae look like diseases that we know well, and that includes heart attacks, strokes, blood clots in the legs that shoot out into the lungs, um, the scarring that we see in the lungs after you've had bad ARDS and, and other forms of, of pneumonia. Um, and so that's going to be the majority. Now, some hospitals have opened up coronavirus sequelae clinics, and so the question is, you know, do you really need a specialist in just uh, coronavirus sequelae, given that these look like other diseases, and we suspect it's probably more of a marketing ploy than anything else. But there are some weird ones that we haven't seen before, but you can count those on your hands and toes, and that the majority of things look like other diseases that we know pretty well. Thank you. Thank you very much. If there's no further questions, thanks again, Dr. Davis, and I hope to hear from you again soon with good information. Good news. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Do we want to go into a, Do we want to go into Michael's report, or do we want to go into council members? Do you want to follow in the COVID? Mm -hmm. Yes. COVID? Okay. So, Assistant City Manager Michael Palmer will give you an update on the new guidelines from the state. So good evening again, Mayor, members of Council, uh, and thank you uh, to Dr. Davis for that wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, it's actually a really good segue and dovetail into uh, some updates that I'm going to provide for everyone. Uh, so on Friday, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom uh, made some pretty significant announcements to uh, where we're headed statewide, uh, which will definitely affect all cities and counties uh, kind of moving forward. So uh, everything that I'm going to be talking about uh, was effective as of Monday, the 31st of August. Um, and there's a lot of caveats on that. But I want to kind of start first by talking about what happened at the, the 
press conference. So what Governor Gavin Newsom announced was a new way of uh, providing uh, guidance for how we're going to move forward. Uh, this new guidance is now called the Blueprint for a Safer Economy. It replaces the existing county data monitoring list. So before uh, we had an attestation process, if you're in attestation county, then you could apply for certain things. There was different tiers. Uh, it was very fragmented, and this new approach is really meant to make everything a lot simpler, uh, make everything a lot sh more streamlined, uh, and hopefully eliminate the 58 different ways of doing things. Uh, so like I said before, this went into effect beginning on August 31st. Uh, this new framework is really based on four principles. It's based on a statewide approach, it's based on its simplicity, a slow approach, and stringent or more restrictive measures. Uh, in order for counties now to progress, they have to demonstrate progress in two different categories. And I'll go into a little bit more about what these categories are, but one of them is the positivity rate, the other one is the case count. Uh, and counties must demonstrate progress in these two categories over a three a week time frame before being able to move into the ne next tier. Counties may only move forward one tier at a time. So if your data looks really great and you can't bypass the next step, you have to kind of slowly progress. And so that's what they mean by slow and stringent. Uh, and really, moving through these tiers, uh, the state through the California Department of Public Health is going to uh, assess these indicators weekly. Uh, they are going to uh, assign each county a tier based on their adjusted case rates. And um, the tier status is going to be in effect uh, starting on uh, this last Monday. In order to advance, the county must uh, have been in the current tier for a minimum of three weeks, as I mentioned before. Uh, each county must meet the criteria for next tier, and then the state will establish healthy uh, equity measures on activities such as data collection, testing access, contact tracing, supportive isolation, and outreach that demonstrate a county's ability to address those most impacted within the county. And they must have additional measures addressing health outcomes such as case rates, hospitalization, and deaths. Um, that's to move forward. Uh, a big thing of this is any updates to a county status will take place uh, be following the state's review and counties with rates in two different tiers and I'll show you because LA is actually a really good example of this will report will be placed in the most restrictive tier so if you're doing really well in one and not so well in the other tier you're gonna automatically be placed in the most restrictive tier so you have to bring both numbers up in order to progress forward in all tiers, though, uh, there are some restrictions that are going to continue to remain in effect. Um, essentially, concert venues, convention centers, live theaters, nightclubs, and theme parks are going to continue to remain closed statewide. So regardless if you're in the most restrictive tier or in your, if you're in the least restrictive tier, uh, some activities such as those that I just mentioned are going to continue to remain closed. Additionally, there's going to be no live audiences at professional sports. Uh, so you know, the, you know, the governor has not really given a time frame on when those type of events are going to come in, but I think you can start to infer that we're going to be in this for a while. Uh, this, those types of events, such as concerts or anything that uh, has a, a large mass gatherings, whether indoors or outdoors, are going to continue to be prohibited, at least until the short term. So anybody who is in, unfortunately, the event planning uh, world, uh, and it was hoping for things like convention centers uh, or large conferences to come back, uh, I would expect to have those remain closed at least for the rest of this uh, year, if not into the next year. Uh, another thing that is really important to note before I move into what these tiers actually are is counties can uh, still retain the ability to be more restrictive. And so you're going to see this really play out, especially in L.A. County, at least for the short term. Hopefully we'll eventually move forward uh, with some significant progress, but that's really important to, to note. So, like I said before, and I apologize, it's a little hard to read, essentially there's four different uh, tiers now. Tier 1, which is the most restrictive, is called widespread. This is color-coded purple. The next tier is substantial, and that's color-coded red. Moderate is orange, and then the least restrictive would be minimal. And under each one of these, under the widespread, uh, this essentially will mean that many non-essential indoor businesses and operations are going to continue to remain closed. And then 
as you progress, they're going to uh, slowly ease up. So as you move into the substantial tier, some non-essential indoor uh, business operations will be closed. As you move into the moderate, some indoor business operations will be allowed to be open. And then once you get into the least restrictive tier, the minimal tier, most indoor business operations will, can, will be allowed to open, but with modifications. So this new tier system is a, a four-tiered system. It's got two categories, as I mentioned before. Progress must be demonstrated over a three-week period, and the most restrictive status will prevail. Uh, so uh, again, you know, with the uh, first category, you've got new cases. Um, the thresholds are uh, more than seven, four to seven, one to 3.9, and then less than one. So you need to get all the way to less than one daily new case per 100,000 uh, residents in order to move into the minimal uh, category. In addition, because you need to have um, great uh, stats in both, the positivity test uh, to, in order to move into that minimal category would have to be less than 2%. So really, what does this mean for uh, Avalon and specifically for uh, Los Angeles County as a whole. Uh, we're doing uh, pretty decent, at least right now, for the testing pos uh, percentage positivity. Our seven day average or seven day lag is fi at 5%. And that threshold, um, we're right on the cusp because that threshold is 5 to 8%. In order for us to move into the moderate, we'd have to have that below 5%. So we're, we're really close. The, the bigger thing for us right now is, and unfortunately, I don't see this uh, changing too fast is the new cases. Right now we're at a rate of 13.1. Anything more than seven means that you're going to be in that most restrictive, uh, that widespread category. So uh, while we're in the red on one, we have to default to the purple category for, for that. So. Um, once we're able to drop that down and we would have to have less than seven at threshold for us to move into the substantial category would uh, drop that 13.1 percent uh, case rate to uh, seven percent case rate and again uh, as we move forward too even though we uh, are in a category that may allow for additional uh, businesses to be open, if the county does not allow us to, then we're going to uh, continue to be under more restrictive measures. Uh, right now, uh, LA County is uh, contemplating having discussions about what a uh, uh, what an approach would look like and how to lessen some of those restrictions. And I'm going to go through some of the sectors and show you some of the differences within those sectors in this PowerPoint. But it's really important to keep in mind that right now we're still under the default of the county health order that was last revised in uh, August 12. Uh, that could change within the next week or two, um, but right now, uh, and I wouldn't anticipate them doing that prior to the Labor Day weekend, so uh, it would continue to operate under the assumption that uh, nothing has really changed for LA County. So just to illustrate some of the differences as you're moving forward, uh, on the left-hand side is where we're at. We're on the, uh, the widespread or the tier one category. If you move to uh, the right, that becomes less restrictive. So one good example of what's happening here is on hair salons and barber shops. Statewide, if you're in tier one, you can be open indoors with some modifications, and that actually holds through uh, each one of those phases. Again. While it's allowed statewide, LA County, under their last revised health order, because they have not amended that and they have not uh, given any indication on where they're headed with this as of yet, um, we're not able to provide uh, out uh, to allow businesses to operate indoors. Right now, they can only operate under what's allowed under that county health order, which is uh, modified outdoor operations. And, you know, they're kind of limited in what they're able to do. Another good example of one would be. Uh, retail and here you can see how uh, you start with something that's a little bit more restrictive and as you move into the other categories some of those restrictions get lifted so with retail operations uh, under the tier one you can be open for indoor operations but with some modifications uh, however you're limited in capacity to 25 percent of your store's capacity as you move into the next tier that capacity increases to a max of 50 percent and then those capacity limits are are then uh, removed as you move into tier three and to tier four. Uh, the other one I'd like to highlight is like on 
uh, places of worship. Right now under Tier 1, only outdoor operations are allowed, so you can only do services outside. Uh, that actually uh, changes, though, if we move into Tier 2. And beginning in Tier 2, you can have indoor services uh, and other uh, types of, of cultural or religious uh, activities happening, uh, but you would be capped at 25% capacity or 100 people, whichever is fewer. And as you move into tier three, that increases to 50% capacity or 200, and then that 200 people or fewer limit is completely eliminated as you move into tier four, uh, and it just you're just capped at the 50% capacity. Uh, moving into uh, just a couple others to highlight restaurants uh, right now uh, restaurant operations under tier one are, are allowed only outdoors uh, but that changes with tier two so hopefully we can do this and move into tier two as we uh, get later into the end of the summer and into the fall season uh, because that's when we are we will be allowed to have indoor operations with some modifications however capacity is going to be capped at 25 percent or one 100 people, whichever is fewer. Uh, when you move into tier three, it jumps to 50%, uh, but with a cap on 200 people or less. Uh, and then uh, tier four, you get uh, a max of 50% capacity. Bars will continue to remain closed, unfortunately. Bars, breweries, and distilleries. These are basically anything without uh, full food service. So if you're a restaurant and you've got a bar in there, you can uh, still operate as you can today. But if you're a bar and you don't offer any restaurant or food type services, uh, you're going to continue to remain closed. Unfortunately, from uh, the tier one and tier two, uh, you can begin to open up uh, as we move into tier three, uh, but with modifications. And you can't even bring people back indoors into bars until uh, the county as a whole hits tier four. Uh, so just to recap real quick, uh, right now LA County is in tier one. We are in the widespread category. Uh, that is because, uh, again, as I mentioned, we uh, are we default to the most restrictive case, even though we're kind of in a, a, a we have two different assigned statuses. Uh, the current health order that it was last revised on August 12th uh, is going to continue to prevail. This order is more restrictive than what is allowed by the state. So while you can see other counties may take a different approach, uh, hopefully uh, LA County will continue those discussions and move forward a little bit faster. We will be in this for a minimum of 21 days. So we'll be in it for you know quite some time. Uh, we'll need to drop that number down. The, count, the state will have to verify that and once we get both uh, numbers into the next category or better, then we'll be allowed to advance. And then we'll have to wait again until the county revises their health order in order for us to uh, really implement the full state order. And then additional information, because we are uh, still under the LA County guidance, uh, the website is there. If you go to publichealth.lacounty.gov, uh, there's a link right there for more information on COVID-19 related uh, guidance, and you can click that button, or you can just put uh, forward slash media, forward slash coronavirus, and all of their guidance is done. They've just revamped the website. It's a lot easier to navigate. Uh, so with that, uh, is there any questions? Are there any questions, Matt? Uh, no. Uh no questions at this time. Okay. Council? Yes, question. Oh, sorry, Lisa. Go ahead. Uh, what, what, what sector would public transportation fall under? What section would what? Uh, public transportation. So, for example, the Catalina Express. What? So public transportation would be an essential service, so they're allowed to continue to operate um, just as we've been um, before. Okay. And did I read correctly? Uh, counties are not going to be able to request to skip a tier. Yeah, counties cannot advance to, so if you're in the widespread and you wanted to move to the more moderate level, you have to go to substantial first, even if the data says that, you know, your case rate has basically dropped significantly and uh, you would qualify for that. You would have to, to only advance one tier. You'd have to be in that tier for an additional 21 days, hope that your numbers continue to be better, and then you could go back, you could go uh, to the next one. That's correct. If Just a, a question on restaurants, knowing that um, restaurants will only be able to operate indoors with 50% max capacity even up until we get through Tier 4. 
and realizing that we have to be in tier one for 21 days and then two weeks in each subsequent category. So that puts us close to Thanksgiving for that time frame if we move forward starting today right now. Well, we could be in um, uh, tier two, which would allow indoor uh, dining services with modifications, but at a 25% capacity or 100 people or fewer, uh, wh whichever one is fewer, as early as three weeks from now. So let's say the end of September. Okay. The only question I have is I'm assuming that we will need to extend dining on the beach that most restaurants can't, will not necessarily be able to operate at only 25% capacity, so they may have to supplement part of their capacity with outdoor operations as well. Uh, and just making sure that that's on an agenda coming up to second meeting in September. We're bringing it back. We Beautiful. were waiting till we went through the Labor Day uh, holiday. Okay, thank you. And just to note, to uh, not, none of this prohibits uh, restaurants from continuing to do delivery or takeout services. Okay, right. thank you. If there are no questions, thank you, Michael. That was thank you. I guess it's simpler, but it's still. Those three weeks here, and uh, it's kind of scary. Okay, and now we'll go to council member reports. Mayor, could I uh, make a few comments, please? Oh, yes. Uh, I forgot to reflect once again that Scott Campbell is on the phone, and he will be doing a city attorney report on uh, a new directive from the governor's office. As also, I want you, the public to know we've been working with the county for the new uh, hospital measure that will be on the November ballot, and it has been named uh, Measure H, for H for hospital. We were lucky to get that uh, letter. Uh, we had did receive one argument in favor, and there was no rebuttals against that, and also just no rebuttals in general. We are going to, I will be reaching out to the council for the week after our second meeting in September, so the week of the 21st, perhaps Wednesday the 23rd or the 24th for the budget. Strictly, we'll just do the budget then and adopt it. It gives us a little bit more time to uh, finalize cuts and uh, contract r reductions and making some other cuts on our budget. Mm -hmm. So I'll be asking you for what dates are best for you. Okay, I'm good either day. Okay, um, and oh, city attorney, then would you like to comment? Uh, yeah, this is Scott. Um, there was some legislation that was passed by the legislature and signed by the governor regarding evictions under COVID 19. The new rules are that um, if you are financially impacted by COVID 19, there are no evictions until February 1st. 2021, which means a landlord cannot evict someone or start eviction proceedings until February 1st, 2021. That rule applies to people that have missed rent due to COVID from the date that COVID first began in March through August 31st. After August, and, and so after August 31st, um, if you want to qualify for not being evicted from August 31st or, or, or today through the end of this year in January, you have to pay 75% of your rent. So if, again, under this new legislation, you cannot be evicted if, for reasons of COVID, you haven't paid any rent um, prior to yesterday, or if you pay rent up to 25% from now until, until February 1st, you cannot be evicted because your failure to pay from from COVID-19. The legislature will have a declaration that you'll have to sign, uh, sign and give it to your landlord. The landlord uh, will then also has to provide it in any language that the tenant has. Um, this still doesn't mean that you don't have to pay, eventually pay the rent. You do have to pay it. And what the legislature has done is they sped up the process for court cases on payments if starting uh, in March of 2021 you haven't paid, you can go to court. Normally it's a superior court case which takes three to six months for, um, for a, a failure to pay rent. 
the legislature has said that these failure to pay rent goes to small claims court. So that's a much expedited uh, uh, procedure. So again, um, if you can't pay um, because of COVID, you cannot be evicted until February. Uh, no evictions can commence until February 1st, 2021. And lastly, nothing in the legislature impacts existing ordinances. So our ordinance, which prohibits any uh, eviction um, for uh, any for any COVID-related reason through the end of the year, uh, still uh, applies. We do not have that. We have to pay 25%. We have a rule that you have to enter into a payment plan. So that's what the legislature has done to give some relief to uh, our tenants, as well as ultimately uh, say that you still have to pay it, and those will be expedited proceedings in small claims court starting in March. I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Hear anyone if there's questions. Oh, we didn't have any. Thank you. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, so, just a couple of updates. One attended a call with Edison for the island feasibility uh, study to be able to look at uh, sustainability over time. And I know they're going to be doing a report soon for council and for the community. Um, but that was an interesting call to be on and, and uh, go through that information. And then just to update on the census, we're just under 29% as of today in number of people who have completed the census. Uh, we were hoping by the end of this month <laughs> to get to 60%, which would be kind of what our numbers should be with regards to second homes and vacation rentals. And so um, we do have a contest ongoing currently, and you can submit, if you have taken the census, um, your confirmation screen to Scarlett Casares of the census, and um, that phone number, let me pull it up for you guys here, is area code 909-493-4574. Again, that's 909-493-4574. You can also email scarlett at casares.scarlett. That's C-A-Z-A-R-E-S dot scarlett, S-C-A-R-L-E-T-T -T, at gmail.com. She is an employee of the census, but because our contest is extending a few days past the census deadline, she's worried that she may not be able to access her census email after the end of the month. And so she's asked us to go ahead and send them to her Gmail account um, if you're using uh, email as opposed to text. If you had already taken the census and worked with an enumerator to do so and are not able to get a screenshot of your completion page, please go ahead and email or text to Scarlett anyway with your first and last name and when approximately you completed that with the enumerator and who you completed it with um, and we will count that as a submission we've gotten a handful of entries so far for the first and second weeks we'll be announcing the first three rounds of winners at the end of next week uh, first prize is a $20 gift certificate for the Catalina Coffee and Cookie Company. The Chamber has been kind enough to donate um, four rounds of $50 each, which goes to almost every business in town, plus an additional round of $100 um, for the uh, for the sixth prize. And then the final prize is a $500 gift certificate from Leo's Drugstore, um, which of course I think anybody could use. So please make sure to get those submissions in. The deadline to get those submissions in is the 2nd of October. It's the final Friday, excuse me, the first Friday of October. Um, we'll be doing the final drawing that afternoon. Uh, but we're happy to try to incentivize the people that want to get their census filled out. This impacts our school, it impacts our roads, it impacts public projects, it impacts things like coronavirus and how much funding we get from the federal and state governments, and it is extremely important to do. It's completely confidential. 
It does not impact your housing. It does not impact you as a citizen or non-citizen. There is no citizen question on the census. And so we're hoping to get the numbers up quite a bit over the next 30 days. So thank you. Thank you. Michael? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, para los que no pudieron atender la junta y del hospital y todavía te necesitan información o tienen preguntas, por favor mándenme a mí un mensaje y también tienen la opción de hacerlo en las medidas sociales del hospital si quieren. Gracias. Can you give us a hand? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I was just letting them know for whoever uh, did, who missed the meeting for the hospital, the town hall, they still can reach out to me okay. and then they have the option of asking those questions as well on social media. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, question for Matt Baker. Um, is there any possibility of seeking funding through FEMA uh, under a state of emergency during COVID? Jordan and I actually have a meeting this week to discuss it. Yes, that is one of the avenues we are looking. Uh, generally, FEMA is a cost reimbursement basis, so 75% of the, the spend would be covered by FEMA with a local match of 25%. Um, for signage, uh, PPE, things of that nature, we've already spent twenty-five to thirty thousand. Um, so potentially, seventy-five percent of that could come back uh, through FEMA funds. Um, so that is something we are looking at. But it's all, to my understanding, at least a, a cost reimbursement basis, and uh, seventy-five twenty-five. Okay. Um, well, that also brings me to my next update that uh, as part of the executive board of the Gateway Cities COG, we met with, um, participated actually in a couple of Zoom meetings with congressional members regarding the need for local funding and for municipalities as well as pushing back the deadline for the census and the importance of that. Um, I'll also have a Zoom meeting with Edison to receive that same update tomorrow and um, various other gateway cities uh, meeting tomorrow night and a few others in the upcoming week. Great. That's all I have. Okay. And I have STAG tomorrow, Southern California Association of Governments. Um, so, just a couple of things, Denise. I, I, I believe everybody was sent the information about the casino dock and then the, um, that again, but when are we going to discuss that? I believe it's slated for our next meeting, Annie. Oh, great. Okay. If not the first meeting in October, as well as that's when Edison will be doing their presentation. Okay. I'm just concerned that as time goes on and that process takes a long time and then we select somebody, we definitely lose another summer. So uh, that was my only concern. If we could have an update either, and I talk, we talk, discuss this either in writing or um, about the development impact fees and where we are on that. Thank you. Um, and does anybody know the rules about drones? It seems as though, those, because I've gotten a couple of inquiries, they personally don't bother me, but they do bother some people, and there's been somebody who's been very active. Um, so do, it seems that like we discussed this a long time ago. Yes, I, I think I need to unearth our memo that we had, Annie, because off the top of my head, I cannot remember what those guidelines are yeah. or if they have changed since that time. Yeah, because they were FCC regulated, right? And then, but I don't know. Um, Scott Campbell, did you hear that question on drones? Yes, I did. And the FCC is still putting very, very much limitations on the use of drones, but we can uh, update that at the next meeting and, and was, have a memo for you. Yeah, it was just something I would, you know, be nice to be able to respond and say, well, you know, we have no regulation over that, or yes, there's a capacity of so many feet, and you then, oh, and the chief is walking up, so he must know something. <laughs> It's uh, regulated by the FAA. Oh, FAA. The FAA. Oh, yeah, they do. Uh, if, you, if you go, there's a, a bunch of information at oh, the yeah, FAA yeah. website. Okay. Uh, and it's typically anywhere near airports or where there's going to be other aviation assets. Okay. So if they want to be 20 feet above my house, that's, that's not an issue? No, I mean, that's... Not, not, to, not to the FAA, it's not. Right, okay. And I don't know if, it, again, it's not a situation for me, but I don't know if we ever went so far as to say that we need to regulate something locally, but then how are we going to track that and, you know, I mean, my goodness. Typically, and maybe Chief could uh, elaborate on this, but when requests, 
videographers uh, for anybody who's doing filming for uh, either as part of under a film permit or for weddings or other events uh, they'll contact the city uh, and then uh, an email will go out to both the fire chief as well as uh, captain hawking uh, and uh, the harbor master letting them know at the proposed date when they were going to fly the area that they were going to fly in and a contact person and then uh, if anything were to happen let's say we had a helicopter that was coming in and need a, to uh, go to the hospital or something else that we would then contact them uh, let them know that they needed to cease and desist immediately uh, and lower their drone until that incident was done and then uh, clear their airspace basically and then they would be uh, followed up with another call to allow them to resume operations. Okay. Annie, I think you're referring more to the residential ones, though, that mm -hmm. are flying from personal people here? Non-commercial. Yes. We have nothing that regulates that, but that I'll ask Scott if we can do something about it. No. I, I don't know how you can get rid of them. Anything, but I don't know if you guys, if you all have an opinion one way or the other. I mean, I, it's only one drone that I've been seeing da almost daily, but that's okay. And so, unless you have total opposition, I mean, you live up on the hill, and I don't know, but impacts you at all. And I mean, I see we see him a lot. Um, I've only ever had one encounter that I felt was a violation of personal space, but um, I don't know. I've not heard any particular complaints, so I don't really have a position on it. Okay. Um, but happy to discuss it further if anybody else would like to. We, do we, don't you think we have other things to work on? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> is that okay when yeah. let this one lie? And whoever the gentleman is at Wilton uh, and my neighbor across the street, hopefully you heard this. Okay. Um, oral communication. Uh, can I, can I, I, there was one thing I forgot. But sure. Got um, at the last planning commission meeting, a, they were discussing CUPs on if it was had been changed over to the new policy. Um, is that going? Is that ordinance going to come back to this council to approve, and when? Uh, yes, and I don't have an exact date. Uh, we'll shoot for October. Okay. It's just, it's just that they had that they weren't sure if it had been passed on if it goes with the property or with the owner. That's what we talked about, and I think we all agreed on. Agreed. But I don't. But I don't think the ordinance was ever brought to the council to be voted on. Oh. That was before this council. Right. So, Denise, do you remember if we finalized that? I don't think it came back. It had to go back to the Planning Commission for some clarification, and that's okay. where it lied. So, as Michael said, we'll try to get back as soon as we can. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, ju I just wanted to, to see if it was coming back. So. No, but, okay. Yeah, the Planning Commission had already uh, inquired about that at the last Planning Commission meeting, and we told them that we'd be following up. Okay. Great. Okay. Oral communication. This is an opportunity for people in the public to discuss items that are not on the agenda. You will be limited to two minutes and no action will be taken. Mr. Palmer, do we have anybody calling in? I do not have any comments. Okay. Captain? Go ahead. Okie dokie. We'll move on to consent items. We have four items this evening on the consent calendar. The first one is minutes from the August 18, 2020 regular city council meeting. We have warrants for a total disbursement of $1,349,484.97. And that's from the time period of August 8th through August 21st of 2020. Number three is to adopt the resolutions amending the memorandums of understanding between the City of Avalon and the International Association of Firefighters Local 2295, the Avalon Municipal Employees Association, management and confidential employees. And I did get a uh, response back from all of them. They were good with the changes. I did provide the council with those resolutions uh, in case you wanted to read through them, but everything was outlined in the staff report. Number four is the contract with Townsend Public Affairs and is to authorize the city manager to execute a contract with Townsend for grant management and legislative advocacy for a one year term for the cost of uh, 4000 per month. I did also provide a memo to you outlining some of the things. All their uh, COVID related since this is hit uh, have been invaluable to the city of Avalon. Daily we get updates from them which Michael uses in our uh, briefings to um, those 24 <laughs> people that are on the calls on Monday and Wednesdays. So uh, they are invaluable to us. 
when those were before? Just a question. What is, what is mode shift feasibility study grant? Is that transportation of some sort? J Jordan? <laughs> Yeah. That, that was the, the mode shift is basically the um, active transportation plan. Uh, it's an element of the active transportation plan. Okay, because another, okay, because there's the grant as well. Okay. All right, council, what's your pleasure? I'll move to approve items one through four. On consent. I'll second. Any questions, comments? Call for the vote. Tonight you get to use your buttons, please. Yeah, okay. All eyes. Good job, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, item number five. Oh, that was your first official button. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, she cleared it for us. Nice. <laughs> item number five is a, an amending of our ordinance. Michael uh, Palmer has been working with BBNK on this, so he can give you a really brief summary of this, and <laughs> if you have any questions for him. Sure. So good evening, Mayor, members of council. The item before you tonight is the uh, introduction and uh, waiving of all readings of an ordinance of the City of Avalon to amend Chapter 12 of Title VI of the City of Avalon's Municipal Code, uh, which will basically bring us to into compliance with the Department of Water Resources Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance. I'm going to use the acronym MUELO instead of uh, saying that mouthful. Uh, it's also uh, to adopt a resolution which will update our guidelines for implementation of the city's model. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to give a very brief background and overview of what this ordinance actually uh, is. Uh, so back in 1993, uh, the Moelo Ordinance was enacted from the 1990 Water Conservation and Landscaping Act. This was updated in 2009 from the state's side and again in 2015 at the height of a drought. Uh, the 2015 update uh, via an executive order uh, directed the California Department of Water Resources to update the state's model to, to prevent water from being wasted on irrigated landscapes and requires local agencies to either adopt uh, the state's model or a local equivalent. And really what the Water Conservation and Landscaping Acts meant to do is to increase water conservation and efficiency in landscape design, the installation, the maintenance, and the management to reduce water waste and overwatering. Uh, less uh, the issue here, a much bigger concern, especially in communities that have a lot of really uh, big green belts, a lot of medians, uh, less impactful here. We just don't have a lot of landscaping uh, period, a lot of, not a lot of space. So back in 2015, the city updated uh, one section of the uh, MOELO, uh, which was regarding the design of landscape-related stormwater management practices. However, the state did not adopt a uh, local equivalent. So there was a couple pieces that we needed to, to look through and we need to adopt. This is really important because a, lot, a, a couple cities have already been sued for not being in compliance. So we want to make sure that we are in compliance uh, and we bring uh, the city back up to what the state standard is. So the proposal before you today is to uh, bring us into compliance with those policies and guidelines. I'll just highlight a couple of uh, significant updates to the DWR's 2015 MOLO. Uh, this includes uh, lowering the threshold from 2,500 to 500 square feet uh, or more for uh, new construction projects with aggregate landscape area. Uh, this is land aggregate landscape area would be things like uh, concrete or uh, uh, deconstructed or um, uh, pebble or any other kind of aggregate. Uh, the other thing it does is uh, any qualifying landscape projects must have pressure regulators and master shutoff valves. Irrigation emission devices uh, in qualifying projects must meet national standards. Uh, basically what they want to do is they want to ensure that these sprinklers that are being installed or these irrigators are high efficiency, that they reduce the amount of water that is going out. And we're also trying to reduce the amount of overwatering into hardscapes. Uh, so part of that is median uh, strips cannot be landscaped with high water uh, high water use plants uh, we don't really have a lot of medians that this would apply to but we do want to bring us back up into compliance uh, and then the last thing I'll highlight is projects with landscapes under uh, areas of 2,500 square feet must comply with the MOLO requirements by conforming to uh, the measures outlined in uh, in the proposed ordinance uh, 
Uh, so uh, with that, uh, that's um, the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, any questions? Yeah, it really doesn't affect us much, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, unless there's some big development going on somewhere, but, um, but this is great. I understand we need to do this, so is there a motion? I'll make a motion to introduce and waive all readings of an ordinance of the City of Avalon to amend Chapter 12 of Title VI of the City of Avalon Municipal Code to comply with the Department of Water Resources Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance to adopt resolution updating guidelines for implementation of the City's water efficient landscape regulations. There's a motion. Second. Okay. Wait, who was my second? I'm sorry. Yes, Sarah. Sarah. Thank you. Okay, call for the vote. All eyes, and this will come back at the next council meeting for a second reading. Great, thank you. Item number six. Dan Hungy. Remind you, you did get one written communication on this yes, item. Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you for hearing this item tonight. Um, before you is discuss the need for a program that supervises children in a school day program for working parents of children first through fourth grade and direct staff to implement accordingly. Um, in July, late July, we had some parents reach out to us at staff um, asking if we could run a program similar to the day camp program we're running over the course of the summer. Um, we took that information, we saw uh, you know, a thread on Facebook, people asking about it, uh, coming up with some ideas of how they could you know, set up their own uh, pods throughout the community to do it. Um, so we took that information and put it into a survey that went out um, in early, late July, early August, um, asking the questions that you see before you in the staff report. Basically, we were looking to ascertain how many people might be interested in the program, uh, what the financial implications would be if we ran it real similar to the day camp program, what hours of the day, are they looking for a daycare program, are they looking for after school program, um, what access did they have to internet, uh, what access did they have for, to computers, um, and would the fees that we propose, which are the um, in here it was 17 and 70 for a week, $17 a day, and 70, to, uh, 70 for a week. Would that be uh, detrimental to be able to uh, be involved in the program? And what ages were we looking for? Um, we anticipated we were looking probably at the younger kids uh, that might have the need for it, um, with the older kids being a little bit more um, uh, computer literate, uh, being able to stay home, um, and being a little more independent. And then what kind of um, access to middle school or high schools was there a need there as well? So with that, um, our takers away were that we could run a program that would be similar to our day camp program. Um, there are county um, protocols for the day camp program that we adhere to really closely. Um, we kept both our junior guards uh, program and our daycare program uh, on the smaller side. Uh, we, uh, look to keep both of the programs uh, eight to one ratios, eight children to one instructor. Uh, we do something real similar to that. Um, I use junior guards as an example. Uh, in years past, the county had 40 in the program. Over town, they have um, an upwards to 120 per session. Uh, we kept ours at 24 for the session uh, with three instructors, so we kept that eight to, eight to one ratio for that. Um, the program would uh, be branched out onto multiple locations. Uh, we're looking for outdoor locations that could accommodate uh, seating area for eight to ten children, um, but also have the ability to, if we had to move indoors for inclement weather, to be able to, to give us that ability. So the the areas that we're looking for, and we just looked, you know, pretty closely to what we've already been using. Uh, we've been using Singing Waters, the Christian Center for a Meals and Meals program, and they've got a nice patio outside uh, that could parlay into an indoor program if we needed to. Uh, Tremont Hall um, is not being used right now um, as a community facility. Uh, so the parking lot outdoors and again indoors if needed. And then we reached out to Avalon Community Church um, for their outdoor patio. Though it's a smaller area, uh, we think we can get six to eight kids out there. Uh, and then the fallback would be the team center if we needed to be indoors. Um, in discussions with the, uh, the school, um, and now that we're starting to see this, uh, with today being the first day of school, kids are starting a little bit later. They're starting at 9 o'clock uh, and going to about 3 o'clock. 
Uh, again, we're gearing this towards first to fourth graders. Um, initially, um, we would have staff uh, arrive at 8.30, do write down procedures as part of the you know, protocol. Um, to whatever areas that were going to be used and have children arrive at 8.45 and be ready to go come 9 o'clock. Um, pre and post uh, programs that uh, sanitation would be involved throughout this uh, like we did in our uh, summer programs, wellness checks for both staff coming in as well as kids, so temperature checks and just oral. Um, parents would not be allowed to leave until they had their, their wellness check. Uh, facial masks would be worn throughout, um, unless eating or drinking. Uh, social distances, the tables would be socially distanced. Uh, would be one, children, one child per site or per table, uh, which would be distance. Uh, no shared equipment, um, limited exposure, uh, kind of the hardest part for the staff of the summer was the, the limited exposure to the kids. You know, you want to be able to throw them a high five and, you know, that boys and those type of things, but um, strictly um, socially distance uh, the staff as well. And that um, kids in the same uh, family would be put in the same pod. You have a first and fourth grader, which isn't necessarily typical for a, you know, a, a program, um, but to kind of reduce any type of spread, um, that was one of the recommendations, uh, one of the guidelines for this. So um, with that, I just want to open up that discussion. I was asked to reach out to PARSAC, uh, and I did. I talked to the representative this afternoon, and um, he um, was um, very similar to what, what I heard when I'd asked about the summer programs that, um, you know, certainly follow all protocols, you know, masks need to be done, social distancing need to be done. There is a specific waiver, um, a COVID waiver that uh, along the general liability that the parents would have to sign, there's a COVID waiver that they would have to sign as well saying it's a high risk program, it's a high risk, um, you know, type of an event. Um, and that, that waiver would be signed as part of the file, as well as um, signage at all our sites, which we've done at our park sites. You know, we've got signage saying, um, you know, it's, it's COVID, it's a high risk area, um, there's shared uses here. Um, so we'd have signage throughout that. Um, so with that, I'd like to just open it up for discussion. Um, we would anticipate using the staff that we had for, uh, some of the staff that we had for our summer camp program, our junior guards program, uh, to come back and assist us with that. So they're used to the protocols that we've had in place. Um, we anticipate um, if we were to move forward, we would try and get this on board um, Tuesday the day after Labor Day, so a week from today. Uh, we would work diligently to try and get it uh, online uh, by the end of the day tomorrow and then start registrations. And then we would take eight, ten kids at a time, um, put them at a site. If we had another eight, ten, we'd start a second site, and we think we could accommodate. 20 to 24 to 30 kids at least initially um, and then start a waiting list thereafter. Um, as we went through the survey process, um, in a pretty short period of time we had uh, 15 um, uh, recipients of the survey, uh, fill out the survey, um, you know, the 15, uh, four of them were in Spanish and 11, and um, the overall need at the time was, you know, 13 of them said, yes, we're looking for some type of program, and, and two, we're not looking for a program. So uh, we, we continue to hear that there's a need out there. We've got uh, more and more people asking about it, um, and just want to get uh, council's blessing before we move forward. I would be more than happy to, on a you know, two-week period of time, you know, report back you know, our findings and what kind of um, registration and how things are going, uh, at least on the onset of it. And our hope is that you know, the kids will be back in school in you know, October, mid-October, November. Uh, we're planning on this through uh, the, at least the first semester, so uh, just till after the first of the year, um, if we need to go that far out. But hopefully they're back to school before then. Questions. And the fiscal impact to the city yeah, is. So let me just ask one uh, and add to that. So the fiscal impact, thank you. Um, we um, are going to charge this as a fee-based program, you know, anticipate having a fee-based program using the summer camp fees, a real similar, you know, structure. Our day camp is about six hours, um, and this is about the same time, six to seven hours, um, you know, the day. Um, so we would use those fees. So a combination of those fees, and then we were, uh, granted actually had to go back we've been blessed by the Carolina Island uh, Yacht Club 
uh, with multiple uh, uh, program grants. And uh, one of them was a teen center grant we got for $20,000. We reached out to them, you know, going into this fiscal year, knowing that finances are going to be difficult. Um, they were able to uh, donate $20,000 to our teen program to be able to staff it um, three days a week, two staff, um, you know, per day. And so I had reached back out to them saying, Teen Center most likely is not going to start until the first of the year. We've missed a you know a half of a year. Can we use ten thousand of that twenty thousand dollars to um, you know put towards this this program? And they were they were fine with that. Um, so we have ten thousand dollars that would go towards you know assisting in the additional staff cost for it, and then scholarshiping um, children that might be or families that might be uh, financially in hardship with uh, you know with a fee uh, for, for such a program. So the goal would be no general fund money out of it. Um, there are some other monies out there that I think if we, you know, did run this um, and we needed to rely on, we could we could call on. But for the time being, um, with my projections, we ran one site. We are set for you know with the money, uh, with the fees that we would be charging and the monies that we've got through this, the donation uh, for 31 weeks. If we ran two sites. Uh, we would be at 16, just about 15, 16 weeks would take us right to the first of the year, which I kind of think is where we'll end up with, with you know, one to two sites. If we ran three sites, it would take us up to mid-November uh, in funding, um, and then we would need to reach out, and there's some opportunities to reach out for some additional funding. So I have a question. Uh, for the kids that are in school right now, how many hours do they have to be signed up online? So I had a, um, a conversation with uh, some uh, administrator on Wednesday of last week in regards to it. My understanding was um, from nine to noon, about two hours, hour and a half to two hours of that block was gonna be online. Uh, and then they've got some workbooks uh, that they're working on as well. And then in the afternoon, you know, from lunch, you know, lunch on, it's, um, you know, in and out of being online. So um, it was more of a bulk in the morning. Um, and then working out of books uh, a little bit late, later in the morning, and then kind of in and out uh, mm -hmm. later in the day. So, you know that, hopefully, you know I'm supportive of, supportive of the city getting involved in this, totally. I'm just with, I guess, a couple little concerns, and I'm sorry I didn't discuss with you before, but it doesn't really matter. Um, the amount of money per week for a family that's a little bit scary for me, I mean, for, for families, I don't know, $72 a week, um, when you had, of the people that said it would be a problem, 10, 10 of the 14 said that, that would be a problem to pay. So, um, as they said, that's a deterrent. But then, so I'm kind of wondering on the hours, if, we don't have them here eight or nine hours a day, so I don't know how much we're really gonna be able to help the working person maybe part of the day and then two or three hours a day you're still going to have to find somebody else to take care of their kids i would think right because assuming those people work at five or if i go to work at noon and work till eight so i i guess and i know you can work it up but those are the kind of concerns i have is it's number one do we need to do five or six hours with with each kid could we reduce that being it doesn't seem to solve the child care problem very much. If we're basically uh, trying to be more of a tutorial, then what would be the best hours for tutorial? If they're supposed to be on the machine, if they're supposed to be on the machine from 9 to 12, we're basically saying we're taking over the parents' responsibility to get their education, correct? And to help them with their education. Yeah, so we, we're not looking to, to be tutors in this program. We're looking just to supervise those that are, uh, for uh, children that are working, supervise their uh, schooling as you know, parents are at work, giving them the ability to, to go to work. Uh, mm -hmm. I see what you're saying in regards to we're not, we're not you know, eight to five, um, mm -hmm. so we may not meet all those needs, um, but we are trying to meet the needs at least during the, the school day. Yeah. Another little concern I have, because I'm already hearing stories on day one from people about children and how they're behaving, I would like us not to see, to take care of children that are problematic. If they're gonna come and they're not gonna participate and they're not gonna be with their, kind of like the kids that go to the library and they just, you know, it's just, 
there's a little bit of a supervisor there, but not really. I would like us to have some rules so that if, if a child really isn't getting with the program, we have to say, I'm sorry, because you're not licensed teachers, you're not whatever, and so I don't want to burn out the staff. Right. You, know, you know what I'm saying? Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so I think you're hearing me. And I'm a little concerned about the do dollar amount. I think when Cindy asked what, what's the impact of the budget, if you budgeted it out with the staff, mm -hmm. is that, uh, and I'm sure you did the budget, is that $100,000 and then, but we're looking to recoup, you know, 80 based on your numbers and then 20 out of donations or more? No, it's 100% funded through donation. I know, but you must have done a budget to say this program through through the first semester is going to cost this much, right? Okay, and I don't know what that number is. And then, and then, again, the no, I'm a little concerned if, and I, and I was asking Dan earlier, so I don't know how many kids are in three, uh, first and fourth grade, a couple hundred. I was able to get those numbers. Um, okay. Bear with me if I'm here. So, uh, first grade, there are 32 um, students, uh, second grade, 34, third grade, 42, fourth grade, 30, and then we went up through fifth grade, 48. So, 217, um, 217 students. Okay. So, if you have 217 students, and just of the people who responded, you had 13 yeses that they need supervision during school hours and two that didn't, that's a huge percentage. That's a huge number of kids. That's 87%, so you do 87% times 217, that's a lot of kids. Uh, and we're only look, looking to be able to serve 24 to 30. And that's better than nothing. I, I'm not saying that. But then if you take that same number down, that same percentage down to can you afford this, that's a high number. So uh, if that's 87%, that's saying 80. So I'm just concerned that we might need some, I'm not saying city funding, but some creative funding for this, whether it be sponsorship, sponsor a kid, um, or something. And, um, because if it's a matter of first come, first serve, how do you just, you know, it's kind of like doing the, doing the vending thing. It's like, do you give so many to the to low income and so many to the ones that can't afford it? Um, other than first come, first serve, that makes me a little bit nervous because only we, so, we had so few responses. So if I can, if I can add, and if this, uh, you know, hopefully it correlates to, you know, what we'll still do in this, the school day program. Uh, during the summer, um, and granted, um, you know, we've got working parents at the same time. We've got some that use the summer day camp program as a as a need for childcare. Um, we are seeing. We saw 16 kids. We didn't see you know 75 kids in a long waiting list. We had probably a couple kids we weren't able to accommodate. Um, Pre-COVID summers, uh, we've seen the numbers up in the mid to high 20s uh, on our fuller days. So I, we think that's kind of the number um, that that need the program. Yeah. Um, and in regards to um, the, the funding for this, um, what I, how I budgeted basically eight kids per pod, we could get 10, so there's a little bit of room for you know a little bit more revenue there. And I took four of those kids at $18 a day and then four of those kids scholarship, at, so 50% scholarship. Okay. So um, there is some, you know, there is some, some room there um, also. Um, came up with a you know total weekly uh, rate um, of revenue. Um, it's cost us about seven hundred and fifty dollars a week for um, staffing in you know, one site, and that's snacks, a little program materials, some cleaning right. materials. So it's cost us about three hundred and eighteen dollars per week per site uh, to run a site. Okay. And then I just took that number, and divided it into the ten thousand. If we had one site, um, you know, double that. If we had two sites, and so that's how I got how long you know the kind of run rate with that uh, that ten thousand dollars was going to be right okay well, thank you for sharing all that i know i know you've been thorough in this I, but it's nice to have it explained uh, I, i'll just add uh thank you we had a wonderful conversation and you certainly answered all of my concerns one being um the liability and having anything happen or any child contract you know that coming back on the city um my second concern that i just 
I, I'm supportive of a program, but one of the one of the concerns that I have is that Long Beach Unified School District is saying no in-person classrooms, and we have all these rules from the state and from Department of Education, and so. I guess I was really concerned about the city stepping in because everybody else says no, and the city stepping in and saying, yes, let's do an in-person gathering. So the liability to the city, if there really isn't any, then that sort of squashes all of my concerns in general. But I just feel a little bit awkward saying yes when everyone else is saying no. And I think that I would rather try it and see how much participation we have and see how maybe on a, you know, we try it for a short period of a couple weeks or till the end of the month and see how it goes. And if we feel that, um, you know, we don't, we don't have any concerns, then great, let's continue. But if we have um, difficulty with participants or, we have you know too many or you can't social distance or it really feels like a liability I would like for that to be very well stated in the beginning that if we do pull the plug on the program it is because mm -hmm. for those reasons but right. I, I am just worried because everyone else is saying no and, yeah. and we're gonna step in and say yes on the other side of that we we need to support our community and we need to to find a way to make something work so that not everybody is unable to work. All right. All right. Please uh, don't get me wrong. When I talked to uh, Parsec, the first thing he said, there's there's liability in everything we do. Uh, but these are the things we have in place. You know, you've got your waiver, you're following protocol, you know, we've got this COVID waiver that they're signing above and beyond your general liability waiver. So um, mm -hmm. there, there certainly is, you know, there certainly mm -hmm. is liability. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've, I've spoken to staff. Um, and being around, um, you know, I've managed uh, licensed child care facilities before, you know, larger ones, um, as well as day camp programs, resident camp programs. Um, it's not going to be easy by any means, but it's going to be a lot easier than just the program we were doing this summer where we're actively trying to program these kids. We're getting these kids, we're checking them in, we're putting them at a workstation and kind of supervising them. Every 45 minutes to an hour, we'll get them up and get the willies out a little bit, you know, stretch them out. Um, but, um, you know, and that's what the day will look like. It's not active programming all day long. Yeah. And, and Cindy, the protocol that he's going through is exactly what we go through at Catalina Kid Ventures. And we have 10 kids going there, socially distant. These kids are three and four and five years old wearing their masks the whole day. They're there eight and nine hours a day. So it's, and they're washing and washing and washing. Like he says, when you've got a daycare facility, the regulations are already so strict. Yeah. So, so. We, we had a, um, uh, I won't get into the family, but we had a, a, a family with three kids that came to our day camp program, and um, one of them was just a, a little bit of a, a monster. And, uh, you know, after we worked them the first day, the second day, you know, we finally had to call the parents in and say, we can't continue like this. He's not listening. He's not staying on his, you know, his dot. He's not keeping his mask on. And so they took him out of the program for a couple of days. He came back the, the following week, and he was with us for the rest of the summer, and it worked out fine. So yeah. when you, you know, asked about rules, you know, certainly um, it's not a right to be able to use it. I mean, you're going to need to follow procedures and protocol that will have in place um, to yeah. participate. Right. Council, other comments? I think we should try it. Yeah, agreed. I mean, we can we try it if it does, and if it doesn't work, then it stops. Yeah. It, yeah. But it doesn't help the community if we don't yeah. give it a try. Yeah, and we can glad that Dr. Davies brought up, um, you know, brought to the attention that we had a bit of a scare in our day camp program. We took, um, you know, precautions to close it, um, but we didn't have anybody affected. We didn't have a parent affected. We still don't think we had any affected. We just got results from the one staff person that was leading that group today. Uh, she was negative, but, you know, our fallback is if it gets a little iffy like that, you know, we'll step back and say it, it's not working. Um, but, uh, but I, again, but like Dr. Davies said, I don't want you to pull the plug we had a we had an incident where we thought there might be some contamination for, from a family member. Mm -hmm. Turned out, you know, where, with all the protocol in place and you do your own kind of contact tracing, the child was perfectly fine, the mother was fine, the grandma was fine, everybody was fine. So uh, just like we pulled the plug just so quickly on that, I hopefully 
we go a little further in the investigation and not just pull the plug. That, that was a test case, wasn't it? Uh, the need yes, for Michael? I, I don't regret it at all, Annie. I know, but going forward, I would hate to think just because of that, if they're following the protocol, that we wouldn't pull the plug in one day. Yeah. Uh, so. One thing that I can add, um, Pat happened to be here, our IT uh, consultant, and I was able to take him to the sites, and so we're able to look at the viability of you know, internet, Wi-Fi, and internet at each of the locations. So um, there's going to be a little cost in that, and that'll be you know part of the, the program cost. Uh, Rotary has already reached out um, and shared that they potentially could help with um, you know program costs, uh, those types of things. So um, there's going to be some need for some additional uh, funding, and I think there's resources out there that we'll be able to right. to get that from. But for the the core of it, we we should be set. Great. Any comments or questions? Okay, we'll move onward. You're on? It's a go. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item number seven. This item is on the agenda this evening at the request of a couple of council members. It is uh, have a discussion uh, to amend the municipal code relating to the time of uh, our regularly held city council meetings, which currently, as we know, is at 5 p.m. It used to be 7, and we've moved it to 5 p.m. Uh, we do have an attached uh, sample ordinance if you were so inclined to introduce and wave readings to go forward, so. I'll start it since I started it. <laughs> okay, look at Michael. <laughs> if, I, if I could read your eyes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of course you know the reason this came about was we were looking, we've been, at, we've been challenged to looking at every way we can to reduce costs. And uh, right now, the only way we've seen, to, most recently, the only way we've reduced cost is through cutting staff. So I don't know if Matt had the opportunity to, to talk about what kind of finances we would be saving. However, I've read the letters from the people who say don't, don't change it, and, and I'm hearing that. Um, but I also, want us to talk about it. I don't think this thing is going to pass today in my mind, but but I think we need to talk about how if we're moving forward into the winter months. Um, and um, anyway, so there's a more to discuss, but go ahead, Matt. Before you start, Matt, I just want to clarify, though, Annie, that we, it isn't just cutting staff, because oh, that I'm was sorry. our last measure to yes. be able to yes. cut a, a bulk. We are going through contracts, we're going through services. So I, I just want to clarify that oh, statement yes. because... Yeah, and we were trying to look for some other ways and to also assist with that. So thank you for the clarification. I didn't mean any offense. Go ahead. So uh, pre-COVID, we did staff the AV room, and that did create overtime. Um, since Jordan and I are the two uh, that work the AV room and we're both salaried, there is no overtime cost. Pre-COVID, we did incur overtime to staff council meetings, but uh, as we're currently staffed, there isn't an additional cost, at least from a staffing standpoint. But but you're changing, and, and just, I know, I know everybody's working hard, and I understand when you're on a salary, you have to do what you have to do, but if we don't have to abuse our staff and have them work 43, 44 hours a week instead of 40, I mean, I, the much as we, because you, because the less staff we have, the more stress and strain is that is on all of you, and you're having to pick up other responsibilities. So I don't want to burn out staff either. So, but I appreciate I, I that. I appreciate that. Um. Yeah. And one of the things we also discussed was if we had it at a lesser time, if there were people that were coming over that needed to come to a council meeting, we might not have to pay for a hotel room and whatever. But now. We're in COVID. Nobody's coming over anyway. <laughs> so, so in a way, I'm thinking that this now has become a little premature because if we really need to look at additional cuts and, but you know, can the new normal be that we always have the city attorney on the phone? Because um, we did it in closed session, we had two attorneys on the phone. So I don't know if that was the changes we make going forward versus maybe changing the time of the meetings. So, 
So I'll just add, since I was the second party involved in the conversation, and the conversation came about in a meeting with the mayor and myself and the city manager as we went through um, a very long few hour list of opportunities for um, cost saving measures outside of staff and benefits. Um, so that's just to add to that. I thought it was very interesting. It was a wonderful education process. Um, as you can see in your packets, I had an email sent out, albeit a little bit later than I had anticipated, sent out to all the city managers of our Gateway Cities region, uh, which is 27 cities. And I, I thought it was, the information that we received back was, was very interesting in terms of, um, what time are your council meetings? Um, all but two of our sister cities, if you will, are at um, between 5 and 7 p.m., except for two cities who their meetings are at 9 a.m. And one of those that's a 9 a.m. is a once a month meeting. So that put into some perspective. And then another question that I asked was, how have there been any changes for your city council meeting as a result of COVID? And a majority of the city council meetings have moved online only via Zoom or a go-to meeting. Um, there's only a couple that I've seen that are um, live meetings or in-person meetings, which is slowly starting to move into sort of a hybrid and then potentially into you know going live shortly. So I, I felt that that was worth the opportunity to put this on the agenda so that we can see one of the areas that we're excelling very well is that we are together live, we are able to be socially distanced, and we are able to have the public participate um, in person, outside, even though not in the council chambers themselves, but outside and able to come in and give their oral communications in person. That is not the case in all the other cities. Um, so just adding that in. And then city staff gave us information on, um, I just want to say maybe 50 other cities on this graph. I'm not sure the exact number. 37. 37 on this graph here, um, starting from the larger cities, Los Angeles, San Diego at 10 a.m., going into, you know, next largest cities, Indian Wells, Santa Barbara at 1 to 2.30 p.m. start times. So it, it isn't unheard of, but a majority of the meetings in Southern California that we see based on this um, is between 5 and 7 p.m. So with that, another of the concerns that we've um, experienced, at least in the six years that I've been on the, both of us have been on the dais here, is that it's, it's not unheard of um, over and over and over again in, in a lot of our meetings that we're here till 10, 11 o'clock at night with some, we need to have conversations publicly and we need to take whatever time it needs to to go through those conversations and generally speaking when we do have those difficult conversations they're very emotionally taxing and they're very difficult and so another compromise that i thought of was which i've seen through this process of education is there's quite a few of the cities that do start their closed session before their council meetings so um that being you know maybe that would be four o'clock if we had one maybe that once a month or, or you know once every two months when we do have a closed session starting that a little bit earlier because that would re that would help us to be able to have our legal team who needs to be present or others consultants or whatnot be present in the closed session portion and allow us to still start our meeting say at five o'clock um, and do our closed session first so that when we're done with our, our meetings in general, sometimes those difficult conversations that we, we can sort of just move through the end of our evening rather than, you know, that, that being the bulk of the difficulty um, earlier. And the public doesn't participate in closed sessions, so that wouldn't be a hindrance um, in terms of uh, being open and available. So that's all my points for why this is on the agenda. I'm happy to keep it at five. I'll throw out the offer of closed sessions starting at four. Um, but just to share with the community the rest of the reasons why we did that. Yes, Anna, do you have an opinion? Um, you know, I actually did want to keep it at five. It seems like the concern is, you know, 
people want to be involved and that's what we're here, we're here for them. Um, so I actually like your idea if we did have a closed session and have it beforehand and then keep it up. Michael. Michael. Okay. Here Michael goes. <laughs> Since I got elected to City Council this last time, I have been saying we need to change from five to six because of COVID on my side in that with the boats changing times as to when guests arrive, it has made it difficult on some days to get here. Um, when you first moved, when, when a previous council first got elected, one of the first things on their agenda was to change the time of meetings from six to five, and I was able to lobby them not to do it at that time, but then you guys ended up doing it later on. Um, there's a lot of people that get off of work at five, so they now have to go home and rush to try to see a meeting on TV or to be here in, pres in person. Um, there's another way of fixing the issue in that you also change the way we the, the, the median set up on the agenda in that we do all of department heads, we do city manager's report, we do council member's report all at the beginning of the meeting when that all used to be at the end. Um, so to me, it, it's always been taking more away from the public being able to voice what they had to say and more of the council putting their agenda in front, in front. Bottom line on this is that we're elected to be here to represent our community and however long it takes for us to make a decision, then that's what we were elected to do. That's what we've committed to. I mean, I'm willing to stick at five. Some days it does get a little tough when I have to run up over home and back over here. But I am committed to five. I, changing it and taking that availability from the public would just really irk me. I, I just want to chime in on that comment alone because I've, I remember hearing that from you before. Mm -hmm. A lot of, of my uh, per particular members of the community that I spend a significant amount of time talking to are servers, work in the restaurants. They're working during the whole meeting anyway. There's only a small portion of the community that is not working at any given point. And so five o'clock for a lot of what I get involved in in the community, everybody's working at five o'clock or just starting their, their work evenings. So I just want to be fair and say when you're saying the community gets off work at five, it's a portion of the community. It's not the community. You're talking about the business community potentially that gets off at five, you know, bankers hours, but there's a significant amount of our community that works in hospitality and that is all evening as well. And I know for the, for the population that usually shows up at these meetings anymore when we have those, they were an older population that didn't work, and so they didn't like being here till late at night. So that's why they were very happy with the five o'clock. It worked very well for them. And I know, and we talked about if I'm a business person and I have something on the agenda that is of concern, I'm able to get off of my place of business to go take care of that. Whether, you know, Steve, Steve Gray comes more than anybody, I think, and he, works every night and he doesn't start his business till uh, till five at night so that's why I'm thinking about people like him to come a little earlier but I realized you work a regular job and thank goodness so and Lisa I don't know your hours so I mean it's sounding like we want to keep it I believe we all work regular jobs <laughs> we just all work different hours, different hours. Okay. okay but it's not it's not to be at our convenience, it's supposed to be at the public's convenience. But I don't think anybody ever said it was at our convenience. I'm talking about, I work 12 to 14 hour days, six days to seven days a week. So it doesn't matter to me. Whenever we have a meeting, I'm gonna leave my place of business and come to a meeting. So I have no issue with that. And never was that any part of this. This was never about us individually. When it started two weeks ago, the conversation was about a cost saving measure. And then as it got more and more, and as I started looking into other cities doing their closed session first, I started thinking about sometimes we're calling Scott Campbell at 10 o'clock at night and, and one, two, three others at that late at night. I'm trying to be considerate of, of them as well. And I thought, well, 
the, the closed session does not impact the community. So maybe that's an option to do that and also make it you know, easier for, for those that call in for closed session. But this is not about me. It's not about what works. Uh, what works for us, the five of us, the timing, this is, that, it wasn't about that at all. And I have had nobody complain in the last three or four years I've been doing this about five o'clock. About what? About, about starting the meetings at five o'clock. No, no, so. So okay. my, my input on this, I, Michael and I have had discussions over the last few council meetings about starting time and leaving work early and um, I usually, like Cindy, I'm doing, you know, 10 to 12, 14 hour days, six to seven days a week, especially during COVID, we're low staff still. So having to leave staff, my crew early from my job and have them know that they're on their own for those few hours at the end of the day, where the, there is regular hours for that operation that wraps up around five or six. Um, you know, it's it's something that I've asked them to, to allow. When I decided to run for council, there were four or five of us on staff as opposed to two. Um, so it's a big difference in that area. Personally, my biggest question in terms of the staff savings when I saw this come up was, one, if it was, and thank you, Matt, for answering the question regarding um, Jordan. <laughs> I never asked Jordan if he was salaried or hourly, hourly so um, that was nice to learn. Um, and so knowing that the actual cost for staff at the moment may not be necessarily a huge potential increase by keeping it at 5 o'clock, or even if we were going to move it later, but keeping it at 5 o'clock is where I'm kind of moving towards right now. Um, my question was actually for city staff, for, for department heads specifically, um, and city administration, if there's a detriment to moving it earlier because you're then losing already shortened hours to having to prep and be ready for council meetings earlier in the day and losing those couple of hours of prep time and or other work time. No, uh, whatever the council deems is appropriate is good with our staff and we would um, plan accordingly so okay we are not okay. and I, I, I do want to can I address a couple things though uh, so prior to a salaried employee being our filmer right now we did have two other employees that have since been laid off that were hourly so uh, when we entered into COVID before they got laid off uh, we adjusted their hours the next day so we weren't doing overtime but prior to that it was overtime mm -hmm. uh, and the first thing that we changed in the city council agenda at the request of council because people the residents were saying we don't get to hear the council's comments uh, what they report out when you do it at the end of the evening so we moved that first to the beginning of the evening and then in around january of 2018 uh, when I became the interim city manager, I kept hearing, we don't know what the department heads are doing, we don't know what you guys are doing, so I asked the department heads to start coming giving report outs. So any suggestion, you just please give me the policy of what you would like, the, how you want the agenda to, to lay out, and I'd be more than happy to change and adjust that. And as far as a closed session, uh, I would suggest that if we did that, it's on an alternate night then, but still at 5 o'clock or whatever our start time is, only because of the privacy issue of closed session. And when we have it late at night, I know that there's nobody else in our building. Oh, right. And when they did this building, there is no soundproofing. So there would be no um, secrecy. I, okay. I did. And the, the other thing with if we did um, closed session beforehand, we'd have to make sure that whatever time we started that it had to end by the five o'clock time when we done it prior yes. city council. Though, I think, right? we have uh, planned it uh, many there's been quite a few times michael where we started at 4 or 3 30 yes and we right. had to have a hard stop time unless the uh, city council agenda reflected that it the regular meeting would start at it it's, after it yeah and in the day, they used to sometimes be able to provide us something to eat, remember, on those, on those big ones. Those so so days are gone, Andy. Days I are must gone. Days are gone. So you're going to have to eat my little snack things, those little snack. Okay, so yeah. what seems to be the consensus at this moment? Leave it alone. Keep the way it is? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Michael? Yeah. Lisa? And I had forgotten about the closed session, so that could have saved us a few minutes of discussion. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> or, or, or or confidentiality, I'm sorry, not closed session. Yeah. But, but I, I would like to point out that this council has not been here at all no. past 10 o'clock at any of our council meetings. I just wanted to point that out. What, this, this group right here? Oh, heck yeah, there's nothing on the agenda because nothing's really happening. In the height of COVID, even when, in the height of, of what we were making, <laughs> what we were going to go meeting every week, we never... Oh, I, I understand. The, the discussions never went on and on and on. Yeah, yeah. Ten might be a little much, but, but I mean, the thing is, all because all of this COVID stuff is being done at staff level, yeah. and they're just giving us re great reports. So, uh, again, that's why I want to be gentle with our staff. Okay, if there's no other business, we're going to say good night to Tony. Good night, Tony. Good night, Tony, and meeting adjourned. Thank you.